Bruce, you must have something really good too. Of course I do. It's Bruce Danielson, and I guess I'm here to entertain you too. All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday, November 17, Sioux Falls City Council meeting. Thanks for being here this evening. We got a couple of councilors joining us remotely tonight, and uh, so we'll go ahead and get started by reading our roll, please, Tom. Council members, Kylie, here. Knight, sir, here. Selberg, here. Sale, here. Star, here. Recky, here. Erickson, here. Jensen, here. All right, here to give our invocation tonight is uh, Gary Wingler with Direct Line Prayer Center. Gary, good evening. Welcome. I'd ask that you stand for his invocation and stay standing for our Pledge of Allegiance. Will you join me in prayer? And Heavenly Father, we come together tonight. We express our thanksgiving and our gratitude for who you are and how you work in our midst. We assemble here this evening and ask that you release your presence, Father, your presence, God, in peace, in harmony, and in unity. God, we thank you that Sioux Falls is our home and recognize your providence in placing all of us here according to your purposes. We thank you, God, for the blessing of our government in Sioux Falls and for the ones here tonight that give of themselves to serve. Father, we pray that Mayor Ten Haken and the council will be blessed with your divinely provided wisdom, your knowledge, your insight, and your foresight. Your word tells us that iron sharpens iron, Lord. So it's our fervent prayer that discussions, debate, the discourse that happens in this place and outside these walls will be that sharpening. It'll be a honing and a shaping of the issues that will define and refine the ultimate decisions arrived at by this body. Father, may your golden rule, that is to do unto others as you would have others do unto you, and the mutual respect that comes from that standard of conduct prevail despite differences of opinion or disagreement. Likewise, we pray that the blessings and direction that we ask of you, God, for this council will also fall on every person here tonight from the staff, the press, to the citizens. Father, we declare as your word says, it is not by might nor by power, but by your spirit, by your spirit, God, that Sioux Falls is a shining light. It's a beacon, not just in this region, but across this nation. So in this Thanksgiving season, we thank you for the culture, the vibrancy, the prosperity, the beauty, and the heart that radiates in and from this city. God, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor this night. We pray it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you, Gary, for uh, your invocation this evening. Council will move on to item four, which is our consent agenda. Look for any uh, changes or a motion on that. Mr. Mayor. Councilor Starr. Thank you. I'd like to pull, I, uh, pull the uh, 2021 PAVE Liquor Wine Renewal from Exhibit B to the Agenda Item 11 for discussion. All right. All right. Any other changes, Council? All right. Can I get a motion? Move approval. Second. Thanks, right. sir. All right, motion by Selberg, seconded by Neitzer to approve this then. Any discussion, counselors? All right, let's take a vote, please. Council members, Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. Move on to item 15, which is our regular agenda. I look for a motion to approve that. Move to approve. Second, Brecky. All right, motion by Kylie, seconded by Brecky to approve the agenda. Mr. Uh, Mayor. Any discussion? Councilor Kylie, go ahead. A uh, motion to amend the regular agenda by moving item 38 to immediately following follow agenda item 20. Second. All right, motion by Kylie, seconded by Selberg to move that item following 38 to follow 20. Any discussion on that, Council? 
All right, let's take a vote, please. Council members Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. All right, that passes uh, eight to zero, so we're main motion as amended. Any other uh, changes here? All right, let's take a vote on this then. Council members Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. We're on to uh, general public input for our agenda tonight. And as a reminder, input during this portion will last no more than three minutes per person and in total lasts no more than 30 minutes. During general public input, the public is welcome to speak on any topic that does not appear later on the agenda. For regular agenda items following general public input, comments are limited to three minutes unless the item is being presented for final adoption, in which case public Im input is limited to five minutes. For all regular agenda items, comments are limited to the agenda item under consideration only. Uh, and per council policy, the chair reserves the right to limit the number of speakers during any agenda item following one hour of testimony, but that can be overridden by a majority vote of this council. So for those of you who are uh, maybe new to these meetings tonight, right now is the time for general public input, not related to masks, not related to COVID, unless, well, I shouldn't say that. If it's not related to the items on the agenda, this would be the time for that input. Uh, we will then move on to um, our agenda items, uh, in which point uh, I see, go, one second please, I'm still conducting the meeting, uh, at, at which point then we will take testimony. Now I see there's a lot of people here who have been here before to speak on masking. I would love to get new input tonight um, so I would love for the people who haven't spoke before to be sure you make your way up to the front soon uh, when we announce that. So I'll, I'll kind of give some directions when we get to that point of the, uh, of the agenda. But I think the point of that being everyone on this council has probably heard almost every single position or issue on this right now. So uh, we're really just looking for new ideas, new information, people we haven't heard from before when we get to that item. So right now, uh, sir, come on up. We'll move to uh, just general public input for tonight's meeting. Welcome. Hi, Stephen Siano. Uh, I want to speak about, in general, uh, it's somewhat related, but the medical community is given too much respect, too much trust, as I mentioned last time, as uh, I've been disabled since 78 with PTSD compounding Asperger's and it's been covered up by medical people throughout all this time. There's a, uh, somebody else uh, that I have watched over through some surgeries and doctors were selling her on an unnecessary uh, surgery and cited the statistics the way that your Department of Health uh, people have been doing in, uh, in promoting the uh, certain cover up whatever um, and I pointed out it's not bearing on any individual. I myself, as I mentioned before, am uh, high risk with uh, breathing problems and uh, AB positive blood um, of this virus. And the vaccines that are being promoted seems to be the very much the hidden agenda. There's money backing this, going into uh, various institutions and uh, vaccines, as has been revealed, have uh, not been shown, oftentimes at least, to be efficacious and uh, have been shown oftentimes to have been harmful. And this is why, contrary to what some say, the vaccine companies are not held accountable. Uh, just like, uh, hey, we got to have accountability with you people, too as I've been promoting, accountability of medical professionals too. I hear them speaking up, saying, hey, we're going to have a vaccine to protect us. Then I hear that there's people of faith that are uh, promoting certain activities, which is like, wait a minute, who do we serve? Uh, who do we uh, worship? Doctors? Not in my book. Thank you. Thank you. 
Anyone else for general public input tonight? I'm asking City Council one more time not to defer pay if club. That's actually, we're going to talk about that on the agenda. So. No, that, no, it wasn't. It was deferred till December the 1st. I have spoken to the owner. We're actually taking that agenda item as being discussed tonight. It was just pulled. So we will be taking public input on that. So yeah. there is public input on it? It will. Any other general public input tonight? Good evening. It's nice to see that there's a lot of people here tonight, but you know, we have city council meetings three times a month. But it seems like when uh, there are items here that people should be showing up at the city council meeting, where are they? It always happens when people have issues that they're close to that they want to show up at a city council meeting, but yet when they should be here, standing up for the taxpayers of Sioux Falls, holding our taxes down, watching how this city council and mayor's office spends our money, what do we do? We sit at home. And then we complain because our taxes went up. Just amazing. The, these citizens have to realize that you don't just come on, you come for what you think you'd really need or what you need to pass. Because if you come here more often, you can read how these city councilors are going to uh, vote. This one here will be unanimous. I told you last week how it was going to be voted. And everybody told me, how do you know? Because I've been coming down here for 14 years. You, you know every single city councilor, how they think, how they talk, what they're going to say before they say it, and who they're playing footsie with underneath the table. Something has to change here, people, and it's all these citizens behind me that can do that job. But the problem is, are they going to show up? All right, thank you. Anyone else for general public input tonight? All right, seeing none, we'll move on then to our next item, Tom. Mayor, the next item was the item uh, pulled from item 11, Exhibit B, uh, the PAVE item, LLC, uh, 130 South Phillips Avenue. All right, Councilor Starr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I um, had worked with the general manager, and there's some issues uh, that they weren't able to come tonight, so I'm going to be looking to defer this till December 1st, but I'll wait and make that motion after we do public input. All right, sounds good. All right, is there anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item? Please come forward. Sarah Bruce Arts Sioux Falls, again, I must speak on the behalf of the police department because that's where I got it from. I spoke to the owner of the club and told him to get his crap together because the high co cost for service is through the roof. Not coming from the inside, coming from the outside. The lieutenant told me that his, the crime is outrageous there. There's going to be more that's going to come forward. And, and I, I know some of you think that this is embarrassment, but it's not. We got to think about the police. We do pay the police, but we don't pay the police to be PAVE's personal police department. Mayor, you have Central District downtown that I just spoke today complaining. They cannot come up here. Why? Because it's a right to work state. I'm speaking on behalf of Central District Police Department. I'm speaking on behalf of the lieutenant. We need a, we need a plan in place here. Deferring it to December 1st is okay, but he should have been down here. Having an excuse that it was short notice is not an excuse. He's cost the taxpayers money with, 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 with the stuff that's going on in that club here. So if we were, we're gonna defer it to December the 1st, I ask again, if he defers it again, to please vote that down. He knows that he's in trouble. He knows that I'm going after him with PAVE. He knows that the police have talked to him about this before and that he's just going to have to face the realities of this. I don't care how much money he puts downtown. It's spending thousands and hundreds of thousands of tax dollars on police calls for service down there. He needs to take the initiative 
to help to, to suppress the crime downtown there. Having no spice and having his patrons uh, put uh, headlocks on police officers down there is outrageous. So we need plans in place here, and I am asking that his license be pulled. All right, thank you. Anyone else here to speak on this? Good day, Mayor and Council Members. Since I just moved to South Dakota three weeks ago, you never saw me before, you never heard me before. Can you state your name, please? My name is Steve Rakis, and sorry about that. I've never done this before. It's the right. first time. I moved here from New Jersey, and you'll have a mask thing coming up tonight, which is mostly virtual signaling. Is this, is this to New talk Jersey, about the liquor license? Huh? We're talking about a liquor license oh, right now? I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't. We'll, we'll let you know when that time's okay, You'll know thank you. it's time sorry to talk that. on that, Steve. <laughs> you bet. Any other public input on this item? All right. Um, Council Mr. Right? Mayor. Um, yeah, do we want to get a motion on the floor and then go to discussion? Someone want to make a motion to? Oh, yes, absolutely. I was just waiting to see. I was waiting for Councilor Erickson. I missed that. Sorry. I would move to defer the pave renewal to the meeting of December 1st, 2020. Second, Brecky. All right, second by Councilor Brecky. Councilor Erickson, we'll go to discussion to you, please. Thank you. Um, I just have a question for the one, uh, the counselor that made the motion to delay as there was no information as far as why to delay and why no one on the council was notified yet another time that this was going to be delayed. Uh, seems very short notice. I have not heard any issues um, from any way or the other and just with lack of response to it. I'm just curious if there's more information because there was none given thus far. Councilor Starr? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the reason it was, uh, as I'm asking to delay, is the applicant asked for the delay. Um, he had some surgery. I worked with Jamie Palmer, our licensing specialist, to uh, ask them to be here and at the beginning, and uh, uh, they asked that we could delay um, because he wouldn't be able to be here this evening. And my question is, what's the point of the delay, the deferring this item? I... I I so don't the know what the issue is as far as. Okay, what, what's the issue with the applicant? That's my question is why are you trying to delay something when there's been no indication? Do you not like the business? Are you questioning their policing? Are you questioning minors? Are you questioning? That's, that's my concern is I'm not interested in just delaying something for the sake of delaying it when they've been given less than a 24-hour notice to be here. That's a star. Because I wanted to give the applicant a chance to be here to answer questions that if anyone had them. All right. Any I guess other? I didn't hear a clamoring for any other counselors to have questions. So that's why I was trying to give you an opportunity to explain that in more detail because I'm still not getting any questions as far as the issue. All right. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Any other discussion? Councilor Kelly? Is Jamie Palmer here this evening? Jamie is here. Come on up, Jamie. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, Jamie Palmer with licensing. Thank you, Jamie. Can you l let the council know if there's any issues or is there any concern with this particular license? Well, there was some um, concerns expressed from a citizen, um, I, I believe, on this. Um, and so when that came up, I called the applicant and he said, oh yeah, I would I wouldn't have any problem being there normally, but he had some issues personally um, that would prevent him from being here comfortably tonight. Um, and so um, we just made it a point to maybe change it to the December 1st, or if, if the council is agreeable to doing that. And that way he could be here if there are questions, if there are concerns, if, if, they, if you guys have questions about their um, security plan, anything like that. So that's what the applicant had requested, um, if, if you guys are willing to do that. So. Can, can you tell me if the citizen was told that this item was going to be deferred to a later date and is not here for that reason? Um, if, if the applicant was told? No, or? if the citizen who had expressed some concern. I believe the citizen that expressed concern was aware, yes, that, that the plan was to defer it to December okay. 1st, if, if you guys are agreeable to that. Yeah, that makes a difference to me. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. All right, any other discussion, Council, on this? All right, hearing none, we'll take a vote on this motion to defer, please. 
Council members Kiley? Yes. Neitzert? No. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? No. Jensen? No. All right, that item passes five to three. Next item, please. Item 17, new 2020-21 retail malt beverage, South Dakota farm wine license and 2021 retail wine and cider license for Chipotle Mexican Grill, 4035 West 41st Street, CUP not required, pending final inspections per fire health and building services. Item 18, transfer of 2020 retail wine and cider license from Lucia Anderson, Day of Indulgence, 5400 West 26th Street to Day of Indulgence, LLC, Day of Indulgence, 5400 West 26th Street. Item 19, renewal of 2021 retail wine and cider license for Day of Indulgence, 5400 West 26th Street. And item 20, special one day liquor license for T Slide Incorporated to be operated at JJ's Axes and Ales, 3016 West 57th Street for an axe throwing tournament on November 19th, 2020. Good evening, Jamie Palmer with licensing. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have on items 17 through 20. All right, anyone from the public here to speak on 17 to 20? All right, counselors, do you have any questions for Jamie on this? Move approval, Neitzert. Second, Jensen. Motion by Neitzert, seconded by Jensen. Any discussion on the council? Not even a little excitement about Chipotle on here? <laughs> All right, we'll take a vote then, please. Council members Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. Next item, please. Next item is item 38, which was moved by amendment. Motion to, recon motion to reconsider an emergency ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota to require face covering in an outdoor public place where six foot social distancing cannot be achieved. The ordinance was considered at the meeting of November 10th, 2020, and the ordinance sponsors were Council Member Sale and Kylie. All right, Councilor Selberg. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to reconsider an emergency ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls to require face covering in an indoor public place where six foot social distancing cannot be achieved. Second, Johnson. All right, seconded by Jensen. So we have a motion by Selberg to reconsider, seconded by Jensen. Uh, the motion to consider is non-debatable, so barring any brief comments from uh, Councillor Selberg, I'll then call for a roll call vote on this motion to reconsider right now, please. I believe the explanation is self-explanatory. Okay. Then let's take a vote on it, please. Council members Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? No. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? No. Jensen? Yes. All right, the motion to reconsider passes six to two. Uh, so that ordinance, which was originally presented at last week's council meeting, is now up for consideration. So it was introduced last week. Here's how we're going to do pub public input. A lot of people here speak to this. Um, like I said, I, I think the council would really prefer to hear from people who we haven't heard from the last couple weeks on this. So if that's you, please feel free to come forward. What we'll do is maybe form a line behind this uh, nice young lady right here in the front. Please try and maintain some semblance of distancing doing that. Uh, we'll hear for public input for probably about an hour, and at that point I'll probably call for either any, any new items or we may um, make a motion to end public input after an hour, uh, of, it, of which the council could overrule that if uh, it's felt that that doesn't want to happen, if they don't want that to happen. So that's what we'll do. Please uh, feel free to make any new arguments. You have five minutes per person. You sure don't have to use all five minutes if your point cannot be made in shorter time. So thank you and come on forward. Good evening. I, my name is Jamie Scarborough with Sambro's Variety. I did get to speak uh, last week and I thank you guys for bringing this forward again to reconsider. I think it's re really important for us to stay open during the holiday season. Um, keep my, my workers working. Um, I'm going to make it really brief so I can give everyone who has a right to speak behind me time. So I, I have a few people here who are also downtown businesses that can't attend for high health reasons and because not everyone here is masked, they were not comfortable to come and testify. So I have some letters here from Mrs. Murphy's downtown um, Irish gift store. 
I have a letter here from Sarah Jamison from Tara Shepherd. Um, I have one from Amanda Wormers from the Game Chest store. And Riley Hankin, my next door neighbor in business uh, the, at the, the Mint and Basil shop. And if somebody could take these, could I hand them to you? You can and, hand them, um, yes. Tom I just will grab want them. to thank you all for reconsidering. Um, we really want to stay open so everybody behind me can, we, all, we can still be here, you know, after the new year and um, serve all these people. And I just thank you for reconsidering. I hope that we can compromise and work this out so that we can all stay open and stay safe and help our health care workers. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jamie. Come on up, young man. You. Everybody's a young man. I think That's... I'm older than you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my name is Brian Goschel. Thank you very much for being here and listening to me. Uh, I'll be as brief as I can be. Um, I have three relatively quick points to make tonight. I will not belabor any one point. Uh, we're living in the epicenter of a pandemic right now, and frankly, I'm actually quite disgusted even having to be here to help try to convince you to put a mask mandate in place. Uh, first thing is, even if, a, even if I mandate people wear masks at my business, I'm the general manager of Vishnu Bunny Tattoo downtown, we know a little something about staying safe from bloodborne pathogens and airborne pathogens. Uh, it doesn't really matter because people can get this virus from other businesses that don't mandate this. Uh, now my customers are at risk and my employees are at risk. Uh, side note, we started a mask mandate in March. This new bunny began doing this way back when. All right? So it kind of works. None of us have gotten it. A mask mandate has, uh, so even if I mandate it, it doesn't really work much if everybody else doesn't mandate it because they can come into my shop without a mask being worn in the last place and they get it. I mean, we all know how this works. All right? Um, a mask mandate has teeth and it would be effective. The reality is, is people are motivated by four things. Uh, doing the right thing, praise, fear of punishment, reward. All humans are motivated by those four things. Okay? The fact is, a mandate will get most of those people. Saying it won't get all of those people is a zero-sum game, and we know that's just ridiculous. But if we get more people, it would be effective. Second part, you have no problem telling me that I can't light a cigarette right now. I can't pull a cigarette out of my pocket, light up and smoke. I don't smoke. But I can't smoke, and the reason I can't smoke is because I'll get these guys sick. I'll get you sick. Literally. That's literally what you're saying the mask mandate wouldn't accomplish. But yet, you were able to do it with cigarettes. It was painful. It kind of stunk in the beginning, as everybody remembers. But we did it, and it worked, and no one's smoking right now. So no one's getting secondhand cancer. So it works. Why can't you do that with masks? Third, if it's a city-mandated rule, then it's out of the business's hands, and they can help increase compliance simply because it's mandated by the public, to the public. They can point the finger at you, not the ones politicking, but actually taking care of us. You begged for this position. You raised money. You spent good money. You spent our good money getting right where you are right now. And it's for this. It's not for the 10 best on USA Today. It's not because uh, AARP says we're a great place to retire. It's now doing the sucky thing to help us. We need you to step up. We just, we need you to step up. Please. I have three children. I don't want them to get sick. I'm 55. See, I'm older than you. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Okay? Please. Now, at the end of this, when this is all done and said, I'm going to go home, and after talking to my boss, the owner, I'm going to quarantine for two weeks. Look at these people. Look at them all, without masks on. Look at them all. The signs on the door that said, I thought they were supposed to have a mask on. Almost half the people in here don't have masks. Spewing virus. Just spewing it out. And they think it's funny. We need a mask mandate, cops. They literally think it's funny. You can't 
expect people to do good. It's why we have laws. It's why we have a health department. We can't expect people to not feed people warm mayonnaise either. We just can't. Why does the health department? It's what we need a mask mandate for, with teeth. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. All right. Good evening. Hi, I'm Walter Ports. Uh, first of all, before I read what I have to say, I don't think any of you guys should have to be making this decision. Um, I think it's a top-down thing. I think all of you have been put in a place where, obviously, you don't want to be. Um, so I have just a little something that, that I want to say. Uh, thank you for hearing me. Um, <clears throat> you've had the smartest people in our state in this room telling all of you what needs to happen, what the best course of action is. But they, <clears throat> excuse me, but HIPAA laws prevent them from showing you photographs of what this disease looks like. You don't get to see it. You don't have to feel it. You've heard from families that have lost loved ones, but they can't be there with their loved ones to hear it, to see it, and to feel it. <clears throat> I've photographed every part of my life, and most of it's out there for people to see. I'm a photographer by trade. There are some photographs that nobody ever gets to see, and today I'm bringing them out. My mother choked to death and gurgled and swallowed after we took her off a respirator. She had MAC disease, which is not COVID. But I'm telling you, I had the fortune to be in that room with her. And nobody else gets to have that right now. And I want you to see what that looks like. And I've had the fortune of being with two of my relatives that have been on respirators at the end of life. The first one is my wife's grandmother, Marge. This is what this looks like. This is what it looks like. I don't care about these people back here without masks. I don't care about what they think tyranny, tyranny really is because they have no idea. What's tyranny? It's stuff that we had to deal with 200 years ago. A mask mandate is nothing. And this right here, this is my mother. This is Helen Ports who died of MAC disease. It's important for you guys to see this and to understand what's happening in those hospitals. Yes, it's numbers. Yes, we don't want masks. Who wants to wear this all the time? Nobody does. But it's not tyranny. It's compassion and it's love. That's why we need to wear a mask and that's why you guys have to do this. I know there's people talking about money, but you know the average social security recipient gets $18,000 a year and we've lost 500 of them. That's money. That's real money in our economy, isn't it? I'm just, I just don't understand. I don't understand how you can think about these photos and what this looks like and give a shit what the people back here complaining about masks and their liberty care about. I don't care about them when I'm thinking about somebody like this. I just don't. I can't care about your silly little worries about a mask when I know there are people going through this up there right now. Every day we are having 20, 30, 40, 50 people die. And it's got to stop at some point and we have to put something into action to do just a little bit. Now I know that the new mandate, maybe it doesn't have the same teeth, but you know what? If you save one person with this, I don't care about any of these people's cries for tyranny and cries for liberty and cries for freedom. We fought for freedom from a king that was oppressing us and stealing us, stealing our money and oppressing us. We didn't fight for tyranny over a mask. It's entirely different. And I'm sorry I'm so upset, but I just, I can't, after seeing that and watching that and seeing somebody choke to death and die and that last gasp of air as they suck it in, that sound you never forget. And you know what? When that sound exhales from these people up here, it doesn't make a sound. The body no longer has anything left to give. It just seeps out. And then there's nothing. And that's what's happening right now. Thank you guys all for your time. Thank you. Good evening. Hello, I'm Daniel Hevlin. And uh, having talked to some of the other guys back there, you've heard about how masks, the appropriate masks for stopping viruses are, are 
not these masks. They're actually more robust. I, you've probably heard all their arguments before. They shared them with me. But I think that there is something new that I can add because I've never heard anyone else ever say this. So the CDC took people that were in the hospital for COVID in, in New York, and 85% of the people that they surveyed were wearing masks, and they caught COVID and ended up in the hospital anyway. And, and so, well, I empathize and care very much about the people that are have loved ones that have ended up on respirators, the fact of the matter is that everybody wearing this type of mask will actually cause more people to end up in the hospital because, for instance, my grandpa is 87 years old, and, and I've had this conversation with him that he just simply should not go out whether he wears a mask or whether everyone else wears a mask or not because compromised individuals will still catch COVID and die even with the best countermeasures in place. For instance, my wife works at Sanford Hospital as a nurse on the orthopedic floor and on, or on the ortho neuro floor. <laughs> and on the ortho neuro floor, they take all precautions that you can imagine to prevent the spread of COVID. However, two patients, at least, that my wife knows of have contracted COVID even though they entered the hospital without COVID. And so these countermeasures, which I agree, the businesses, they want to stay open. Be, they think the mask will help that. But the fact that they haven't gotten sick is, is not relevant to the fact that they're wearing masks. On Kelloland uh, a few weeks ago, it was reported that SDSU researchers were working on a mask that can stop COVID particles. It, the masks are a false sense of security, and I understand why people want to believe in them because they want to continue on with their lives, but, but the reality is that it is a false sense of security, and, and that should be taken into consideration uh, on top of all of the evidence that, that masks haven't actually stopped the rise in places where they were mandated because people go out and they can still catch it. Uh, and, and then the other thing, the reason I came down here, which I'm sure you've heard this argument every time, is that I just don't recognize this as my country anymore. And everywhere that has implemented one of these mandates has just continued to add more and more mandates, and it's never ending. And, and I'm... And as much as I'm afraid of my relatives, not afraid for myself, but afraid of my relatives that are immune compromised dying, I'm more afraid that this country is just becoming some place where nobody would want to live. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Daniel. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ask for no applause after any public input, if that's okay, so we can keep it. Civil, so thank you. Good evening, sir. Good evening. My name is Jerry LeClaire, and I would like to speak in favor of the uh, face mask. And I believe that wearing a face mask is not a individual right uh, issue. It's a public health issue. Uh, and it, the COVID-19 virus does not care if you're Republican, independent, Democrat, whatever. It is going to uh, attach onto the ne easiest uh, uh, transfer site it can. Um, <clears throat> and in regards to face mask, engineers uh, have published a article in Thrasic, and they de demonstrated that a medical grade face mask virtually does not allow any particles to pass through with a cough or a sneeze. A two layer uh, cotton mask does almost the same thing. A one layer is about 30 to 50 percent, and a, uh, a sneeze causes a massive release of particles into the air. And it's interesting that the COVID virus is somewhere between a droplet and an airborne uh, virus, and that it will travel somewhere between six and nine feet. Um, and about 50% of the cases are spread 
from pre-symptomatic people before they even have any symptoms. It's spread to the uh, whoever they come in contact. And a person was in China who resided in Toronto. Uh, he was in Wuhan and uh, he flew to his uh, transfer airport for a 15 hour trip to t Toronto. On the way to the uh, airport, he started getting chills, developed a cough, muscle aches, pains, lost his sense of uh, taste and smell, but he put on a medical grade face mask. And the medical grade face masks are the, what you can buy now in Menards, Target, uh, just about all the stores. So he went on a 15 hour trip back to Toronto with the active disease. When he got to Toronto, he got a test, it was positive. He notified that the airline, they did a 25 person contact that uh, was six feet, sitting six feet around him for 15 hours. And none of those people got the COVID-19 uh, virus. Um, and the other thing about masks, you have to cover your nose. You can't just cover your mouth. Uh, most of the virus comes from your nasal pharyngeal, oral pharyngeal uh, area. So if you do wear a mask and you just cover your uh, mouth, you may be transporting more of the virus out than, than you think. Um, I would encourage you to go on the internet and Google Dr. Paul Carson. He's a physician in Fargo who's on the staff at NDSU. He did about a 40 minute uh, in-depth description of um, the generalities of the COVID-19 virus that is very easy for people to understand. He brought up a lot of good points uh, about what we should be doing, how it's transferred, who's gonna get it, and all that. Um, and one of the things that he brought up is that if you're gonna wear a mask, it should cover your nose and mouth, it should be a medical grade or double layer cotton, this should not be an exhaust valve, and the neck gaiter is probably the worst thing you can where because it aerosolizes the uh, COVID-19 virus if you have it and it becomes then uh, a airborne uh, transfer. So again, I encourage you to pass this mandate for the protection of the public. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Good evening. Now you're on, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, my name is Steve Rakis. We just moved here from New Jersey like three weeks ago. And I came here to get away from people that want to push masks on you because that's all they want to do. They want a virtual signal. New Jersey's had mask mandates since April. And New Jersey has con con coronavirus like you guys don't even understand and never see in your lifetime. And so all those masks that they had for all these months, all these people, 100% wearing masks in every store, everywhere, outside. We have a Boy Scout meeting. My daughter teaches in school. The poor kids are in jail. My friend that was in federal prison for nonsense says it's exactly run like a federal prison. So do you want to introduce your children to a mask mandate? Because if you make a mandate in Sioux Falls, they will have a mask mandate in school probably. And, and since everybody likes to talk about money, I have nine children, all right? And we spend a lot of money on food. We have a store in Jersey called BJ's, which is equivalent to your Costco out here. And my wife estimated we spent $25,000 just on food in this one store for nine children. Well, my wife went to Costco last week, and they told her, you have to wear a mask. And she just said, no, I don't. So now we're shopping elsewhere, so some other place is going to get $25,000 worth of food, not Costco. They just lost a lot of money. And if you do pass this mandate, I will not shop in Sioux Falls. We will shop elsewhere that doesn't have virtual signaling because one or two council members keep coming back with the same nonsense over and over and over again so they feel good about themselves at the end of the day. Everybody's born with an expiration date. I'm 67. I'm not afraid of catching corona. If God wants me to die, I will die. 
If he does not want me to die, I will not die. And having a mask is the same as saying, oh, I have chicken wire on my window, and I'll keep all the mosquitoes from the Big Sioux River out of my house. Well, it's not going to work. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Right. Thank you, Steve. Good evening, ma'am. Hi, my name is Abby Erickson. I've lived here my entire life. I am a proud U.S. citizen. I'm proud of my country, I'm proud of my president, and I'm proud of my governor. She has given us the freedom that we needed, and now we need you to give us the freedom that we need here. I hear a lot of people speaking, and what they're talking about is fear-mongering. They're stories that don't really have a lot of factual support. So we need to look at the numbers here. Right now, as of today, if you go to Kello News and you look at the statistics for the China virus, you have 80 plus years old. We have lost 362 80 year old plus to the COVID. We've lost 129 70 to 79 year, uh, 79 year olds. That sounds scary. And no one wants to lose a family member. They don't. My grandma, two years ago, she died at the age of 97, otherwise healthy, but she fell in the shower. Ten days later, she was dead. When you're older, your body is compromised. Our numbers here are very, they seem high, but they're not. They're not scary. Our death rate right now as of, as of today, in Sioux Falls, you have a 0.0097% chance of dying, getting the COVID. The younger people, we're just not seeing it. I think there's a misunderstanding of how all of this came about. In 2015, Dr. Fauci sent, along under the Obama administration, sent $3.7 million to Wuhan, China to study this coronavirus and see if they could mutate it. And now, because of that action, it is here in Sioux Falls. But we are fear-mongering, but it's bigger than that. Dr. Fauci, in an interview at Georgetown, specifically said this, there is no question that there will be a challenge in the upcoming administration. That ended up being the Trump administration. He said, there will be a surprise outbreak. Now, you can look at the numbers, and you can, you can analyze it, and you'll realize that you do not, that the chances of dying of the coronavirus are almost unheard of, okay? The problem, the problem that we're having right now is the CDC. The CDC has put out a lot of misleading information. If you want to find this information, I ask you to go to the CDC website. You're going to have one heck of a time finding it. But under the title of comorbid deaths, comorbidity, you will find a little tiny caption that says that 6% of the people that have died of the, the COVID-19, died of the COVID-19 alone. All the other people had 2.5 other illnesses, whether it was diabetes or cancer or whatever it may be. If I put those numbers to the Sioux Falls numbers, to, to, no, to South Dakota numbers, that means we would have had 38 COVID-only deaths. Now, I'm a practitioner of microscopy. I look at blood for a living. I have had the privilege to analyze both pre- and post-COVID patients' blood. It is not scary. It is not. And when you put a mask on, those masks are doing you no good, unless they are a very, very strong protective masks. The majority of the people here are wearing just simple, plain cotton masks. They do absolutely no good. What we are seeing, however, is 
increased rates of bacterial infections around the mouth. We're seeing uh, cases of pneumonia on the rise. That's what we're seeing. So masks here should not even be a question. The reason I think that this is even here today, it's not even fear-mongering. It's we don't want to be the bad guy. We don't want to be singled out. And, and the people in South Dakota Thank are you, known Abby. to be the bad people. Thank you. You need to step up and make Thank the you, right Abby. decision. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Good evening, ma'am. Hi. Hi there. My name is Susan Froschheiser, and um, I've, I've served in the medical community for over 39 years. I'm a member of the Healthy Americans, a group that fights for our liberties. And while Abby was talking, I'm familiar with all the things she was talking about, about Dr. Fauci. I'm a constant um, a person who researches things a lot, and she's, everything she said is true. So my information comes from my own personal correspondence with a doctor. His name is Dr. Rashid Buttar. It's B-U-T-T-A-R. He's from the Center of Advanced Medicine of North Carolina. Um, he's a world-renowned physician who sees patients from all over the world. And um, I have uh, seen several of his documentaries on the subject of health. He's um, very well um, looked up to in his peer group, and he's very well known. So um, this, this information comes directly from him. I got an email from him tonight. You can look him up. And um, why are we wearing masks? Our bodies were never designed to wear a mask. A mask restricts oxygen. Oxygen is necessary for life. We breathe out carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a waste product. When you're wearing a mask, you are inducing hypoxia, which is low oxygen. You're restricting airflow, but more than that, you're creating stress because your body is now having to work harder to breathe, um, and it's restricting your airway. So an already stressed body, in an already stressed body, oxygen re restriction induces more stress. So if you go back to your ABCs, the airway, breathing, and circulation, an open airway allows oxygen to come in so you can breathe, and that promotes your circulation. So when you're wearing a mask, you're reducing your ox body's ability to oxygenate. This throws your body into a chronic stress um, state. It increases your stress hormones, which suppresses your immune system. This is like a fight or flight response. An example would be like having your car in park and stepping on the accelerator. This puts your body into an overdrive situation of stress that's now going to create a domino effect. When your body is stressed, you need more oxygen, your carbon dioxide builds up, and it results in depletion of oxygen to the organ systems. So wearing a mask has never been established to prevent disease. There's no scientific literature and no documented peer review research proving that we should wear one. Now, Dr. Batar is a surgeon, and he, he says very simply, it prevents the spray of saliva from a cough or sneeze into a patient's open wound. So um, given the daily stress that we already have, plus the stress that's caused by mask wearing, we are actually furthering suppression of our immune system. So everybody likes research, so I just want to talk about a, a study that was done in July of 2020, straight from the CDC. Um, it's about 154 people who tested positive for COVID. Out of 154 positive patients, 108 identified themselves as always wearing a mask, and they always, and this was 14 days prior to their diagnosis of the onset of their illness. Of that same 154, six identified as never wearing a mask. So what does this mean? It was a small study, but 70% of the people that contracted COVID-19 always wore a mask. This demonstrates that people that always wore masks still contracted COVID-19. Um, another thing is um, we never seem to address things that can help us. So taking 25 to 50 milligrams of zinc per day keeps the virus from proliferating into the cell. Vitamin D3, 10,000 international units a day is helpful. The other thing is liposomal vitamin C to bowel tolerance. All these things are preventative things. We all need to be responsible for our health. Yes, there are those people out there that that have comorbidities, and they need to be responsible for their health too. But I don't think that um, a mask mandate should happen for this city because 
we all need to take responsibility. And um, it just it just shows that masks don't stop the coronavirus infections. So, and then be proactive in your health. That will go a long ways. So, thank you. All right. Thanks, Susan. Good evening, sir. Hello, my name is Juan Vargas from Two Falls. I am a business owner here in Two Falls. Um, I am a member of the Healthy Americans Who Defend Our Freedoms. There are several concerns they have about forcing people to wear a mask. One grave concern is that 80% of the testing of COVID is false positives. This is according to Dr. Judy Mikovits of Keynes News, uh, August 4th. How can we rightly requ require people to wear masks when the very testing for this virus is unreliable. This is wrong. Another concern is that over and over again, I hear that wearing masks does not help people from getting sick. You've heard a lot of testimony. You've heard a lot of uh, studies and numbers and references from scientists and doctors. And I even heard last week myself from uh, Mayor Tinhaken that uh, you have uh, looked at some cases of other places and there was no difference between the people wearing masks or the mask mandates and the places that were not. So <clears throat> a couple things that um, really concern me on top of all this, and uh, you've heard all this, I do have a uh, one quote that I'd like to mention according to Margaret Humphreys from the Department of History at Duke University. In 1920, the Secretary of, Educa of Educative um, and executive officer of the California State Board of Health revealed that studies from his board did not show any influence of the mask on the spread of influenza in those cities where it was compulsorily applied. But I also would like to uh, quote uh, some of the people that were here last week. Uh, I, I believe I, I heard one gentleman stand up here and say that uh, he hired you to tell him what to do. And I don't believe that is what the intention is of hiring um, our officials. I believe that your job is to, uh, to protect uh, our liberties. I heard Mr. Uh, Sol uh, say that um, we can't control what happens in South Dakota, but we can control what happens in Sioux Falls. And uh, I didn't vote for anyone to control me. Um, this is a great country, and I believe, as our governor has mentioned before, that the people of South Dakota are, are smart and that we are able to take care of ourselves uh, without these impositions and the control over our lives. I believe it's, uh, it's great that people have the liberty to... Um, to uh, 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 propose a mask when they enter to their, to their facilities or to their businesses. That's their right, and it's great because everyone can do what they would like in their business, but I don't believe it should be imposed on anyone else. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Good evening, ma'am. Happy Sherman from Sioux Falls here, and I'm nothing really new. Everything's kind of been said, but... Um, I just be, come before you asking that you please not vote for the mandate. I believe that we are doing all that we can do and that we are being responsible as well as taking personal responsibility for our actions. And I just question, why do you feel the need to require people to wear a covering? And I implore you to look at the science like all the other people have said. And that's what everybody keeps telling us to do. Look at the science. Common sense says that if masks were truly the cure all, end all, the numbers would be going down. Realistically speaking, I venture to say at least 85% of people are wearing them, regardless if they work or not, that whatever you want to believe. Therefore, we should have seen, according to your thought process, numbers recede at astronomical rates. The states with the strongest of mandates and the strictest of lockdowns have seen a spike as an, and an increase as well as those states with a personal responsibility approach. Um, this also goes into, you know, the limiting gatherings, numbers that will be proposed later. Honestly, I just don't know how you think that this is okay under the Constitution and how you think that this is actually part of your job. Like Juan mentioned, it's not to take us by the hand and keep us safe. I kind of feel insulted when I'm 
told that, like, this is our job to keep you safe. You know, as my, when I was a child, that was my parents' job to do, but now that I'm an adult, I feel that I need to take personal responsibility for that. Furthermore, hospitals are not at capacity. We are handling the virus with great strides. The virus is real, and yes, some will die. But for what other sickness have we ever dictated what someone must wear or how their business can operate over a virus with a 99.9% .9 survival rate? And those are actual facts. I just don't know where you can't see that. I propose to you that we have become a very weak society expecting everyone else to fix the problems that are going on around us. Imagine those who have gone before us to pave the way for this great nation seeing the egregious proposals set before us tonight with a survival rate of 99%. Did you know that 45 out of 102 Mayflower people that came over on the Mayflower that first winter died? Total military deaths, 651,000 in battle deaths from 1775 to 1991. Many of these men and women knew that they would meet certain death, but they realized that the cost of freedom was worth it. I would ask that you please step out of the role of trying to control lives and livelihoods, and let us live in freedom that has been given to us by Almighty God. Last time I checked, we are still one nation under God with a constitution and a bill of rights that does not alter during sickness, and I think that's the important thing. And the, the um, question that I submit to you and to everyone, really, where is your faith? And I'm not saying go stand in the middle of the highway and proclaim that if it's my time to die, I will die, because it is your time to die if you're standing in the middle of the freeway. But what I'm saying is just take personal responsibility for, for each of us, for ourselves. Like, I, like Juan said, if the, the business mandates it, that's their right, and I respect that right. I choose not to go there, or I choose to go there and put the mask on. And, you know, and, and I really, you know, I think that's great that we have that opportunity. And I appreciate with the mayor what you did last week, but I feel like often that you flip-flop and like the verse said, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And I just ask that you reconsider your statements that you made last week regarding the states surrounding us that have the strictest of mandates and how we cannot control this virus. That's a fact. We, we simply cannot control it. It is out of our control. We can protect the vulnerable, keep those safe. Nobody wants to see anybody die. I have elderly parents. This may be the last holiday that I spend with them. I don't know that. They're cancer survivors, and we are going to make the most of it. We will be together. We will gather because we are not afraid. We have secured our eternity, and I'm not saying be flippant, be cautious, but live your life. All right. Thanks, Kathy. Good evening, sir. Hi, I'm Kevin. I'm going to edit as I go because a lot of this is just really, really boring. <laughs> that I wrote. Um, in 2019, in, or 2018-19, 35 and a half million people came down with the flu. 34,000 of them died. In uh, 2009, the H1N1 flu, 61 million people got sick and 18,000 people died. In 2008, the H5N1 avian flu, there was 96,000 plus deaths. Um, but yet nobody ran around, lost their head, and said, oh, we need to shut everything down, close the schools, close the, close the bars and the malls, except Walmart. Everything's okay at Walmart. Nothing lives there. And uh, make sure you wear a mask. None of these masks are doing anything. They're fashion statements. Mr. Koyster's wearing a Cougars one. He had on a Pittsburgh Steelers one earlier. They don't do anything. They're useless. This stuff, this bacterial, antibacterial hand sanitizer, it doesn't do anything for a virus. It's a bacterial sanitizer. Might as well be grape jelly. You're reacting out of fear rather than logic. In 2019, 1.8 million people were diagnosed with AIDS. 690,000 people died because of AIDS. No one suggested a condom mandate, and no one was trying to restrict people from having sex. Why don't we do that? The fact of the matter is, this is a virus. Viruses have been around for millions of years, and every year we get a new virus, and people die, and it's sad, and I feel sorry for that one gentleman who lost his, I believe it was his mother. It's tragic, it's horrible, and to have to watch something like that is, is just terrible. But the, the, the thing is, what you're trying to do is nothing. If you want to do something, secure a stockpile of hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir, 
That's doing something. That way when people get sick, you give them the cure. Then they're not sick anymore. It's really easy. You're taking a backdoor approach to something when you should just be going right in the front door. So treat the infected people and let us uninfected people carry on with our daily lives. If people are too scared to go out, don't go out. Stay home if you're that worried about it. You know, I'm not going to come into your house and try and drag you out and go to the hardware store with me. Your approach to this, mandating a mask, social distancing, the uh, don't stand in one place too long mandate thing, they're ridiculous. They're just ridiculous. And I think all of you really know that. You just feel like you have to do something. You have to look like you're doing something. But this isn't it. This is not it. We all have personal responsibility. And if I had COVID, I wouldn't be here right now. I'd be at home. I wouldn't put that on everybody else. But if you're afraid of contracting the virus, stay home. And Randy, rather than demanding that the rest of the population buy into your paranoia, people are not going to obey your whims. And I'd like to find out what the next rung on this ladder is when people violate the mask mandate, when businesses violate the mask mandate. Are they going to go to jail? Is it going to be a fine? What? We'd like to know that. And the last thing I'd like to say is that all of you people work for us. You are our employees. You don't decide what we do. We decide what you do. That's how this works. Unfortunately, the state of politics today has reversed that. And it's time that somebody let you all know that that's how this works. And if you don't like it, you don't have to be a part of it anymore. So no mask mandate, it's ridiculous. If you want to do something, look for a different avenue, something that will actually do something. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Please hold the Pulasco. Come on up, sir. Matt Condon, I live in this city. Uh, first point I'd like to make is that I don't think that this mask mandate is going to be temporary in nature, as you guys are saying. We've seen all over the world that they are just extended over and over and over again. They're only marketed as temporary to try to get people to be more trusting of it. But I think that that temporary description is merely a mask. The second point that I want to make is that SARS-CoV-2 is part of the environment now. It's never going to go away. It's here to stay. Even if masks were effective, and I'll show you later on the, this uh, PowerPoint, that they're not effective. We can't keep running from it. Everyone will be exposed eventually. Just like most people eventually catch the flu or eventually catch the cold, uh, it's going to make contact with just about all of us over the course of our lives. Running from it is, uh, I don't think that's the wise thing to do. So the mask mandate is ineffective because of, uh, well, some data that I have collected here from, what's it called, the, uh, the COVID tracking project, which was released by the Atlantic. You ready for this? Yeah, it's not three. So here we can see in Austria, they have a mass requirement that was imposed just like you guys are trying to do. And you can see there was already a downward trend when they uh, imposed the requirement. And then over the long run, there was another increase. Should have printed these bigger. Oh, thank you. She's very nice. And Germany, a uh, similar point there. The uh, requirement was imposed after you already seen a downturn. Basically, all of Europe has tried this, and three countries specifically have tried the herd immunity mentality, the herd immunity strategy that I went over uh, last week, I think. Then I'll get to that in a second. Is it? Okay, that's clear enough. And here you have Italy, the same trend actually, a crest here, then a trough, 
and then another sharp increase, actually the same trend that we saw in Germany and Austria. So it's as if the mask mandate was completely independent of the actual infection rates, i.e. it was ineffective. Belgium. And here's the, uh, so those three that red lines that you see there on the right are the three uh, Scandinavian countries, if I remember right, they were Norway, Denmark, and Sweden that never had a mask requirement slapped onto the people like you guys are trying to do. And you see all the black lines above them right there, if I can move my finger using the camera, they had uh, spikes right there, whereas the countries that practice the herd immunity strategy right down there did not see spikes. The three Scandinavian countries I mentioned. So uh, this doesn't prove that uh, lifting the mask requirement will make people less infected, but it certainly uh, hurts your guys' case pretty badly. And this is uh, another point I wanted to make, I don't think that you guys are trying to control the virus. I think that you're trying to control people by doing this. I think this is about power. I think that the uh, virus is merely a convenience that's being taken advantage of by Kylie, who's not even wearing his mask on properly, it's backwards, and by Sale. And this is a meme that I think does a pretty good job summarizing my views. It's been passed around on the internet quite a bit. So that's my points. Thank you for listening. Right. Thanks, Matt. Good evening, ma'am. My name is Tanya Wildebor, and I'm really thankful for this country. And I, I was born. <clears throat> in Ukraine, and I lived, I was a very little girl when I was living in, under communism, and now we're finally in a free country. And <clears throat> I personally felt free till 2020. And, you know, we, me and my husband, we run our own business, cleaning business, and we have a people, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our business, what we do. We have not stopped working, we have a, jobs and we are, you know, we're pretty busy, but we have our employees who work in, at nights and they did not wear masks. Some buildings we have to have masks because of medical buildings and we do follow that, but some buildings we don't have to mask. They, what they are cleaning after people are all gone and, and they didn't wear. But the security guards sometimes come and they say like, well, you have to have a mask. And, and they calling our com us to the office and and said like, well, do we have to wear a mask? And we said we don't have to wear a mask, especially there is no no people around. But when we will have <clears throat> mandated those security guards going to be running after our employees and telling them, well, you have to, you know. And do we need to create this? It's very hard to find um, people for cleaning business after hours, part time not a large pay, and we had a, um, employees for 10, 15 years, and we don't want to lose them. And like I said, there are places where they wear, and we have to wear, and that we are fine with that. But like I said, please, we don't want to not vote for mandate and um, deal with our employees. Like I said, there are the places that we ask them to wear, and we have a nice employees, and they do. But we are business owners. We don't want to lose those accounts as well, but we don't want to policing our employees at night and getting calls from security people who has who they think they have more power over them, you know, and that wouldn't be right. I also want to touch base on <clears throat> my daughter was working in the grocery store and she has a pretty bad uh, acne and we spend a lot of money to pay for her treatments. And of course she had to wear it at the grocery store and she had to quit her job because it got so bad and we could not take it anymore, you know? And now she works at the place where, where um, they have a shield and they have a, like that clear shield in front of them. And she's actually very, very happy with that. And, 
And like I said, there are, I, I respect for people who wear masks, and I do wear masks in certain places as well, but I really don't want to be controlled, and especially have freedom for me here in America. I would really appreciate that we don't pass the vote of mandate. That's probably, like I said, we've, we've been in the country where, I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm emotional. It's okay. Person. Don't worry about it. But we want to live under freedom. And I, like I said, if I'm going to go to visit somebody, I will put my mask on. But I, it, it's hard enough already to find employees, deal with that, with that. And if they don't want to wear, and especially nobody around, and somebody going to go after and control, are, are we going to do control each other here? You know, that's going to be really hard. So I appreciate, uh, this is my first time speaking, and I actually brought a bunch of teenagers to kind of see how our city run, and we appreciate you guys, guys all working really hard. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming here tonight. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name's Dan Finneman. I don't know how you turn this thing on, but I tried to we'll flip hand it on this for you. piece of paper. So you can go ahead. We all flipped right. it on for you there, Dan. This is just something I tried to grab. There's more stuff, but as you look, you can see where it says uh, that the amount of, well, I'll read off of this. You can see where it says the increase of deaths. Now look, look in like the 24th week, it was going down, then all of a sudden it starts rising and comes back down, and now the death rate is dropping more. Uh, you're also, Looking at hospitalization, this was kind of had a rise earlier in the year. It comes back down, goes up, and goes way back down again, and peaks and comes back down again. <clears throat> this period of time that you're looking at, has anybody ever thought that is this time people are out getting their flu shots? Because when I drive around town, that's all I see is get your flu shot for 20 cents. Uh, for a gallon of gas, <clears throat> you know, say this, that you members have been given a great responsibility to the city. And it seemed like early on when COVID hit, the great Wuhan virus, what happened to people is fear got in their life. They got all scared that this was going to be the great <clears throat> plague that was going to wipe us off the map, and it's just another virus. I've had brothers, sisters that are older than me all have this virus. They've recovered. I've had friends that have had cancer, lung disease, and they all recovered. And I look and think, why would you put the people of Sioux Falls and the citizens of this state put their children and their family and the teachers in the school system through all this. You know, people say that they're old and it affects the old. You know, we're not always guaranteed another day in life. You know, you live for what you can. But <clears throat> when I look and see why are you, what is the purpose of putting a mask on when people come up and have tried to show the school board and show you members that it isn't doing any good. What angle are you guys at? I know that Christy Noman, thank God for her, that we'd have such a great governor as her that allowed the freedom and the business to be able to operate. <clears throat> Apparently, if you guys had businesses and somebody shut you down because someone had COVID, I've been within two feet of people that have had COVID and I don't get it. And by the way, I had lung cancer. Had my lung removed last year. The doctors say you need to take radiation or chemo. You'll never survive this if you don't. I said my help comes from up above. I've never taken chemo. I've never taken radiation. The only thing that I have done is prayed and took what is called a herbal tea that helps build your immune system. People got to realize like the old the other people were speaking is you got to build your body up so it can fight off whatever comes. When we used to get <clears throat> sick from pneumonia or from the flu, we thought that was probably the end of the world, that we'd never survive it. But 
I guess <clears throat> our parents were a lot smarter. We'd get through it and we'd air the house out and we'd go back on with life. <clears throat> as far as you guys thinking that the mask is going to be the answer, statistics don't show that. You can see in Sweden where they weren't forced to be in lockdown, they weren't forced to wear the mask, that they have some of the lowest uh, death rates that there are. If you, want, if you want to do something and do it for the children of this school instead of making them, forcing them to wear masks, why don't you put school back and put it under God's control instead of man's control? Because my granddaughter had to stay out of school even though she didn't have COVID. They made her stay out of school because some other kid had COVID. That isn't right what you're doing to the families. It's not right what you're doing to the children, nor is it right what you're doing to the teachers. Thank you, Dan. Uh, they get a lot more. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. It's funny how you cut me off, but the other guy that was... Oh, everybody's got five minutes, Dano. Thank you, sir. Come on up. Yeah. Good evening. Go ahead. Yep. Good evening. My name is Amy Willis. I have lived in Sioux Falls for over 20 years. I'm in the healthcare industry and a member of the American Naturopath Medical Association. Uh, I'm a part of the Healthy Americans in Sioux Falls who defend our freedoms. Now, before I say going to my speech here, I just wanted to say I was right between two men. The first man had had a lung disease and he seemed to be breathing fine. The man behind me has a mask on and the whole time I'm standing there, he's laboring as he's breathing. So take note of that, please. Now, I, I do want to say our country is run by law and order. Without law, there would be disorder and chaos. We must uphold our laws and respect the rights of others. About a week ago, I sent each of you council members an email about requiring masks in Sioux Falls. In this email, I sent information from Peggy Hall, founder of the Healthy Americans. Um, according to her, and it's a nationwide organization, she's in California, she's dealing with these kind of things there. According to her research, she says that if you enforce masks and distancing, you are at risk of violating over 22 federal and state laws. This is a serious matter. I want to state that a mask is a medical device and wearing a mask is a medical procedure. It is unlawful to force anyone to participate in any medical procedures, not by you, not by the public, no matter how much they demand it. We are protected by um, a patient's bill of rights. We do not have to submit, submit to any medical treatment. Um, <clears throat> The patient's field of rights is a list of guarantees for those receiving medical care. It may take the form of a law or a non-binding declaration. Typically, a patient's bill of rights guarantees patient's information, fair treatment, and autonomy over medical decisions, among other rights. It means that doctors or medical staff do not have the right to touch or treat a patient without that patient's approval because the patient is the one who must live with the consequences and deal with any discomfort caused by treatment. A doctor can be held, or medical staff member, can be held liable for committing a battery if he touches a patient without first obtaining the patient's consent. Um, these, a couple of these points in this patient's bill of right is the patient has the right to consider um, to consider it and respectful care. The patient is entitled to the opportunity to, to discuss and request information related to the procedure or treatment and the risks involved. The patient has a right to refuse a recommended treatment or plan of care to the extent, um, and in cases of refusal, the patient is entitled to other appropriate care and services. So once again, I say that um, wearing a mask, a mask is a medical device, and wearing a mask is a medical procedure. We are protected by federal and state civil law that we would not be discriminated against. Again, I ask, as I did last week, is it right to take away the free choice of an individual for the perceived benefit of others? 
This is what our forefathers fought against, and this is precisely what our Constitution prohibits. Again, I state that it is at a time of crisis that our Constitution protects us from our own best intentions. I ask who here are the enemies of the Constitution and our civil liberties? Your vote reve will reveal that. All right, thanks, Amy. Good evening, sir. Good evening, uh, Mayor, City Council. My name is Steve Sitting. I am a, uh, by trade, a respiratory therapist, and I do not agree with my labored breathing that was quoted just earlier. Uh, my issue with this is you talk about the mandate. I look at it from more not just wearing the mask, but I look at some of the smaller businesses who are trying to do the best thing. They're wearing masks, they're doing the hand hygiene, they're wiping things down. Yet, like someone talked about earlier, you go to Walmart and you can find any number of people not wearing a mask at all. They're not social distancing in the checkout line. But yet, if you're imposing this on smaller businesses that are gonna have to close down, but you don't see the Walmart or that sort of thing being affected, you can't go to Office Max, you can't go to uh, Menards without wearing a mask. So it can be done. And like I say, this is, I'm more a proponent for these smaller businesses than what could affect them and your decisions. Uh, at that point, I have nothing else to say. Thank you. All right, thanks, Steve. Good evening. Hi, my name is Joy Howe, and I am just here to remind you, again, that you do not have the authority to tell people what to wear. That's, that's not part of your purview. You can make mandates all day long and nobody has to follow them. And I will not follow a mask mandate. I don't care what your penalties are. I will not wear a face diaper. And to see a room full of grown people wearing face diapers should be embarrassing to all of you. As these other people have said, they do no good. If you're going to get the coronavirus, if it even exists, you're going to get it. Um, Fauci keeps telling us that we need to follow the science. And science tells us that the gold standard for determining a virus is to take it through Koch's postulates, which is a series of steps to determine its existence, its virility, and what it actually does. This was never done for this virus. This virus, this supposed virus, has never been isolated. No one could actually show you this virus in a lab. No one. In addition, the test that is used, the gentleman that developed it said, this will not detect viruses. So what is the test doing? It's not looking for viruses. Um, recently, um, several states have locked their citizens down again. And a member of President Trump's coronavirus task force, Dr. Scott Atlas, told the citizens of Michigan, the only way this stops is if people rise up. You get what you accept. I will not accept a meaningless mandate. I will not follow it. And I think you guys need to be reminded, again, you work for us. Your job is not our safety. Your job is to protect our liberty. And everybody in here has a different idea of what their liberty is. And as our... Um, 
founding document said, we have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that is different for every single person. You cannot mandate for 250,000 people what their level of liberty and pursuit of happiness is. And it's not your job to do that. Just protect my right to do that. That's your job. Full stop. All right, thanks. So we're going to hear from this next gentleman, and then I'm going to ask the council to vote if you want to continue to hear testimony. There's a lot of testimony. We're hearing a lot of the same arguments uh, for this issue. So you can come on up, sir. I know some of you have been here a while, but uh, we're really not hearing anything new at this point. And so we're going to let this gentleman speak, uh, and then I'm going to ask the council to take a vote if you want to continue testimony or not. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Mr. Mayor, council members, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'll probably be brief. Some of you look like you're ready for a coffee or a nap or both. I wasn't planning on coming here tonight, so I don't have a, a prepared speech. But um, Can you state your name, sir? I'm sorry. I'm James Gordon. James, all right. I, uh, I moved to this lovely city nine weeks ago. I jokingly tell people I moved to South Dakota because I missed living in the United States. <laughs> I came here from Nashville, Tennessee, which is now the People's Democratic Republic of Nashville. We have seen onerous, draconian restrictions and lockdowns and mandates far exceeding anything that they originally were proposed to do. I understand that we want to do something. No one wants to see anyone lose a loved one. We grieve for anyone who's lost somebody. At the same time, I guess my question is, we're told to trust the science. I've never in my life seen such picky science. It seems as though COVID is more dangerous after 10 o'clock at night in some cities. COVID must be a night owl. If COVID is an aerosolized virus, all of the gaps on the sides of your mask, if it's go passing through the air, it's passing through that. Surgical masks can filter particles 0.3 microns and larger. Aerosolized droplets are 0.014 to 0.002. They will pass right through it. If mass mandates were the answer, and if they worked, New York City, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, three major metropolitan areas all have had a mandatory mask mandate, punishable by fine or jail, since at the latest May or before. New York City just saw its highest increase of cases they've ever seen. More new cases now under a mask mandate not only that, you ask any medical professional, the general public has no proper concept of donning or doffing PPE. Most of them are actually self-contaminating themselves as they pull their mask down to take a drink, put it back on, put it in their purse, hang it on the rearview mirror, put it back on. You're increasing your risk for a respiratory infection, bacterial pneumonia. You guys have heard the argument. You get it. You guys get your power to do this and your authority under Jacobson v. Massachusetts to say that you can restrict liberty when the public health, you know, sees a benefit. My question to you is under that same scrutiny, if you were to present this to a court, can you prove the mitigation efforts of masks? And with such a wide variety of acceptable masks and no set standard for what filtration rate needs to be approved to actually help mitigate can you actually meet that burden to say that you are within your right to restrict liberty because the public health is far outweighed? Can you prove that you are actually benefiting the public health by mandating a mask? We've all walked around Sioux Falls recently. Most people are complying. Go to Hy-Vee, go to Walmart, go to all these stores. 70, 80%, if not more, of people are wearing masks. So if this, was to, if this worked, we wouldn't see the increase in cases. I don't know what the answer is, but I think that we can pretty well establish it's most likely not masks. I know you all want to do something and you want to help people. Mandating a mask is not going to help. And you're going to see a lot of people who are just going to at some point say, we've had enough. The question for me is, where's the line? Originally, we were locked down for two weeks. Then it was a month. New York was going to mandate a mask for three weeks. 
They're still there. If we do not stand up and say no, it will never go away. I ask you to please allow citizens to make the choice for themselves, be responsible for them health, for their own health. And if not, then I say, so, you know, if we are to take such drastic measures to protect the public health, for a virus has a 99% survival rate, then I also suggest that, uh, you know, next week's council meeting, we shall propose banning vehicles, sugary substances that cause diabetes, because those are all a huge risk to the public health as well. How much are you going to allow citizens to be responsible for themselves? And how much authority are you going to take for yourself? Thank you, guys. All right. Thanks, James. That's, all right. Uh, at this at this time, I'm gonna I'm gonna choose to end uh, public input unless uh, anyone on the council wants to override that decision. Then we can take a vote. Mr. Mayor, these folks have been here. They've been waiting in line. I think we need to hear from them. All right. Well, do you want a motion or you want to? We'll not. Shh. Can you please quiet? Yes, because I can remove you from this uh, chambers for decorum. Okay. So what we will do is we will take a roll call vote. A yes. We'll sing, signal continuing with public input, and no will mean we'll move on now to uh, council discussion. So let's roll call vote that. Oh, do we have a second? That's I'll a second that. Okay, we have a uh, councilor Starr and a second by councilor Neitzer. So again, yes, will be to continue public input. Let's take a vote, please. Council members Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. All right, on we go. That passes eight to zero. Come on up, sir. Yes. Um, yes, my name's Colin Crable. I am a citizen of Sioux Falls. And I, I'll keep this brief. I have uh, basically, I'll keep it brief to a couple of points that haven't been addressed. Um, I've been here the last two weeks for the uh, mask mandate, the first one and when it was finally voted down last week and I just want to address a couple of things that were brought up last week um, first first point is on the um, brought up about the Brookings mask mandate we had the statistician from Avira come up and uh, present her evidence and of uh, saying that that mask mandate worked um, two things about that she has just a limited window there where you had immediate drop off and then it, then after that window it went straight back up. From what I understand, Brookings is still under a mask mandate. So the conclusion that she came to that that mask mandate worked um, is honestly fallacious. Um, and another thing on that is that uh, first thing you learn in statistics is that correlation does not equal causation. And when you're modeling data, that you want to take into account all variables and did not bring up any variables. And one final thing from, from last week, um, the, those that are pr proposing the mask mandate brought up the state of Kansas. Well, like the former person that spoke here, I'm a new citizen of Sioux Falls. I moved up here from Kansas two years ago. And for most, much of the same reason. I fell in love with the city, I fell in love with the state. I fell in love with the freedom and the people of the state. And right now in Kansas, they've had a mask mandate since the summer. And right now in Kansas, they are debating whether to go back into lockdowns that they proposed at the beginning of this year. They are looking at putting their kids, pulling them out of schools and closing the schools. These mask mandates don't work. And that's all I have for to you. Okay, Colin, thank, thank you. you. Good evening, sir. Jess C. Vander Whitey. Um, I'd like to point out first um, that I have a speech impairment, so, so thank you for your time. You bet, Jesse. Um, <clears throat> Um, this has kind of been been covered, but to summarize, um, 
there has been no correlation in st t states that have a mass mandate that have lockdowns to uh, decreased case counts um, that goes for America and um, the rest of the world as well. Um, st 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 studies show this again and again, but uh, the media does not report on it. Uh, in fact, they twist the data that um, that ha has been talked about already um, to get the headlines that they intend. Um, nobody is denying the existence of the virus. Nobody is denying that masks do have some amount of filtering um, uh, qualities, but um, these types of mandates have been shown to be poor policy again and again. Um, they come at a gigantic economic cost with no, no payoff. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Good evening, sir. Michael Stangland, uh, Sioux Falls resident for over a decade, and I feel my find myself in a minor awkward spot because when I first came tonight, I plan to open by thanking those who voted against the mandate last week for their wise decision to do so, but then I find you're resurrecting it, and um, you know, I, I, I think that I'm wondering if that thanks is premature because, you know, I also, uh, I don't know about anyone else, but, well, I'm sure there are people here who remember it, that um, at the start of this whole thing, there was the 15 days to flatten the curve, but to quote Milton Friedman, there is nothing as permanent as a temporary government program. So we're months into a 15-day curve flattening program, and recently we had the oh-so-great Dr. Fauci saying that even after we get a vaccine, we're still going to need masks and social distancing because the leading vaccines are reportedly to be only 90 to 95 percent effective. You know, he says that it's time for Americans to do what we're told. I hear that, and I'm sure a lot of other people hear that, and they get the and they hear that these temporary virus responses are intended to be permanent from some people. Back on October 28th, the Argus leader surprisingly published a poll that's saying 57% of South Dakota approves of Governor Nome's response to this virus, and by comparison, a mere 35% disapprove. In, in political terms, that's, that's a landslide. Thank you. Governor Nome has taken a lot of criticism for her response, but it's also earned her a lot of positive attention and shot her onto the national scene because of her decision to actually trust the population of this state and to make responsible decisions. South Dakota and Sioux Falls have earned a lot of positive attention. It's, I mean, we've heard from some of the people who have came, come here specifically because um, we because they want to get away from states that have indefinite lockdowns and treat their, their, their people more like subjects than citizens. So aside from sending a message that people should be looking elsewhere if they want lockdown relief, consider the question of how many people in Sioux Falls actually want more virus rules. I, I recognize there are people here. I mean, I'm not discounting because there's going to be two sides to every issue. But, and I, and I also recognize that Sioux Falls and South Dakota are not directly interchangeable, but when only 35% of South Dakota, Dakota disapproves of Governor Nome's hands-off approach, I have a hard time believing that there's, kind, there's the kind of support in Sioux Falls for more for this kind of thing. There's also been people who have, you know, discussed their relatives and how we need we need this mandate for those relatives, and I mean, we all dislike, we all dislike, nobody wants people to be su suffering. But to present a counter story, I have a grandmother that I assist with, take, I assist taking care of. I live with her, I take care of her. You know, she's not, I mean, she's capable of taking 
care of things on her own, but she does need someone to live with her. She's, she's someone who's in the most vulnerable category based on her age. You'd think that she'd be the kind of person that this mandate would help the most, but to the contrary, my grandma, my grandma who is among the most vulnerable, she doesn't want this mandate either. To the contrary, when this thing was first being discussed, she said that if it passed, she would need to stay at home because when she's wearing a mask, she has difficulty breathing. So it, it becomes a major issue from her when she, has, when she is mandated to have trouble breathing anytime she needs to go out to do anything, aside from you know maybe a car ride so she can get out of the house. As a, as a final point, I remember that when this thing first came through, there was very much a, uh, as an argument against it that, you know, this kind of man mask mandate would be the kind of thing that would tear the city apart. And I have to wonder what happened to that. Furthermore, I ha I'm thinking that with the second one brought forward and everything else, I, I find myself thinking that even if this doesn't pass, there's a lot of attitude and mindset going on right now that whether it passes or not, it's going to tear the city apart regardless. All right, thanks, Michael. Good evening. I'm staying a, just amazing me that we're back to this same issue that we were sitting last week going over this. We had people that came up crying and with the sob story. But did the city council listen? No. See, the thing is, we knew we had a 4-4 vote last week, and the mayor came out and said that he was going to vote against it. I'm hoping I'm wrong this time, but see, the mayor came out ahead of time and stated that he could support this bill here the way it's written, because he knows that he's not going to be the four, he's not going to be the fifth vote, because he's got other people that are going to vote for this. Sad part about it is, again, I live my life one day at a time. I'm hoping that tomorrow I wake up breathing. There are some city councilors that are on this city council that absolutely are not listening tonight, and I could probably tell you which ones they are. I know there are some that are listening. Mr. Selberg, he took his mask off because I think he got tired of wearing it. But it's just amazing that we're going to push this on the citizens of Sioux Falls. But yet again, last week, we had business owners come up complaining that they had to come up with a mandate for their stores, but the city didn't have a mandate. Is this really a mandate for the, for the citizens, or is this a mandate for the department owners that don't want to look so guilty on having a, uh, a mask mandate in their store? Because I'll tell you what, I told you last week, I'll go to any little, I'll go to any little convenience store, I'll go to Harrisburg, I'll go to T, I'll do all my shopping. I won't shop in Sioux Falls. There's a lot of stores that I don't shop at now because I have to wear a face mask. I will not do it. But I'll tell you what, I know I can pass a hat out in this audience. Any one of you guys that want a free trip to uh, New York, Chicago, California, Philadelphia, I'm sure we can throw it all in a hat. We can pay one-way trip for you guys because we don't need it. The people of Sioux Falls are fed up. Everybody that I talk to that has come into this state from Arizona, Wyoming, the reason why they have come here is because they have freedoms. They have a freedom not to have to wear a face mask. They have a freedom to be able to live a normal life. And I do talk to a lot of people that do come into this state from out of state. This mandate here is just a band-aid. Has nothing, has no, has nothing to do with anything. We did find out that we don't have cancer anymore. We don't have heart attacks. We don't have uh, any other disease but COVID. If somebody has a cancer that they have been dying, they die from cancer, not COVID. COVID might be in their system, but they die with cancer. My mom's 83 years old. 
she will absolutely not wear a mask if she doesn't have to. That's her choice. And today, that's what we're talking about, is a choice. I have that choice not to wear a, to wear a mask. Mr. Selberg has a choice not to wear his mask in the meeting. Just like everybody out here, 70% of the people that are at this meeting right now absolutely do not have masks. So I guess we're going to find out where the city council stands because a majority of the people that are here today are not wearing masks. Last week, a lot of the people wore masks. So we'll find out where the city council stands. We'll find out who has already made their decision because really and truthfully, the public only has to listen to their comments and they know who has already made their decision. Thank you. Good evening, ma'am. Hello. My name is Abby Wildebar. I'm a special education in a nearby district. Um, I've been dealing with a lot of grief in the district with wearing masks. I actually have a note to wear a shield. Um, I have three kids in the Sioux Falls School District who I've all exempt from wearing masks, none of which have gotten sick this whole year so far. I myself have not gotten sick even though I just wear a shield at work. Um, my biggest issue is what are we doing in consideration with people that, with special needs? I have kids that fight it all day long. They're throwing them on the floor, putting them in their mouth, and they're being told that they have to wear them. It's unsafe because they're dirty. Um, I was in a classroom on Monday. I think I had this little girl forcefully, I had to put it on her about 100 times. I was there from 8 a.m. to 1.30 in the afternoon. She was screaming, crying, constantly flipping it off. Another kid was chewing on it. He had to change his mask like five times that day, crying constantly. It's just not fun. Um, I understand it's a choice. I have no issue with those that want to wear a mask. Um, we've gone on multiple trips this year, more than we have before, still have not gotten sick. So if masks are the only thing that keep us from getting COVID, then why have I not gotten it? We went to California twice this year. We were at um, Branson. We were at the Wisconsin Dells. Very highly populated areas, considering everything. So I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Abby. Good evening. Hello. Thank you so much for the opportunity. But I do ask that you actually hear me. Hear me out. Um, Can you state I'm your proud. name? Can you state your name, ma'am? Tatiana Klimchuk. I'm proud to be a citizen of this beautiful country. I'm not afraid of COVID. I'm not afraid of a mask. What I am afraid of is that my leadership that I trust would consider to mandate, would consider to put control and control me and my family. What I am afraid of that beautiful citizens of this country my neighbors are trying to control me. You see, 23 years ago, my family, my parents packed their bags and left Lithuania. Why did they leave? Because Lithuania was controlled. Government decided that they have the right to control and tell people what to do. My mom, growing up, when she was a little girl, she shared that um, there was a mandate that, well, churches were closed and people were forced to meet at homes. But there was a mandate that you cannot bring your kids to home church. Well, my grandma never complied. She brought her children. And later on, my mom, she was a great student, but she was prevented from graduating from high school because she was a Christian and not part of communism. And she was prevented and she could not go and get higher education and go and pursue a medical degree. Around, I remember this vividly when I was about five, six years old, police came, or a militia came into my grandpa's apartment and they destroyed it because my grandpa had some dangerous documents, dangerous books. They were just literature. My grandpa loved literature, poetry, history books, religious books. And they raided his apartment, and they took all his literature. They took Bibles. They took anything that was from the United States. They actually have to, had to smuggle um, literature from the United States and other countries, translate it, because you couldn't buy anything Christian, anything faith-based in Lithuania. And my parents, they left everything. 
and they came to this country. They left their people, they left their language. They're still treated like little kids here when they go to the store and people hear heavy accent and their English is broken. They're disrespected. They don't have respect that they deserve. But they left everything because they wanted a better life for me and hopefully for my children. And today, I'm asking you guys, this is not just masks. This is not just a mandate. This is a slippery slope. And we are a country that everybody looks up to. Everybody wants to come here because we are the great United States of America. And we are a state that people right now look up to, and I'm proud of that. And I ask that you guys keep us free. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Come on up, ma'am. Good evening. Hello, my name is Kira. Um, I was one of the first COVID patients, one of the first 50 COVID patients in Pennington County. I'm a caregiver. I used to work in the Monument Health System. In March, the Cancer Care Institute was infected and about 50 caregivers tested positive with COVID. I was one of them. <laughs> it knocked me on a bottom, first of all. But it also allowed me, because I had the antibodies, to work in the COVID unit. Working in the COVID unit is, was incredibly scary, and it was really, really sad. And of the 644 deaths, as of, I don't know, last week when it was tallied up, I witnessed about 10 of them. Not just in Rapid City in Pennington County, but also here. I work, I honestly, I couldn't deal with COVID, so I left and I started working in assisted living and nursing facilities where I would be further away from all these patients coming in and all of these sicknesses. Unfortunately, it still made its way into nursing homes and I witnessed three deaths actually pretty recently, of people. I had tied their shoes every morning. I had made their beds. I fed them breakfast. I gave them pills. And obviously, this is something that I'm quite close to. Since I knew basically, I don't know, let's say 15, I decided that I wanted to help people and I wanted to live my life in service of others. I tried to get into the military, but due to health conditions, I was not allowed in. So I chose health care. Some of the things that I've given up to pursue this career and to help other people. I've gotten rashes on my face because of face diapers. I've lost nights out. I've worked so hard that I cry at the end of my shift. I've watched people say goodbye to their families forever. And I just want to ask, I don't know if I even want to talk to you guys. I think I want to talk to the people out here and I want to ask them why something as simple as wearing a mask, knowing that it could protect lives. And there is proof that it can protect lives. And when people say that it's hurting people with COPD, it's hurting people that have problems with breathing. Go to Walmart, guys, buy a pulse oximeter, <clears throat> excuse me, buy a pulse oximeter, put it on your finger, breathe, you'll see that you have probably 95 to 100% oxygen in your blood. Put a mask on, you'll see that you'll probably have 95 to 100% oxygen in your blood. And I've seen this with people with COPD, people with lung cancer, incredibly old people that are still dang wheezy, and let's say their oxygen, their blood oxygen is 85, and that's their normal, you put a mask on, it's still probably going to be 85. I just want to ask why something so simple, something that really doesn't hurt as many, something that really doesn't hurt people as much as everyone here is claiming that it is. Sorry. It's all right. No problem. I'm willing to give up personal freedoms. I'm willing to give up my time. I'm willing to give up my psyche, my mental health to help and save other people. Why is no one in this room willing to do the same? Thank you. Thank you, Kira. Good evening. My name is Bruce Meyer. And contrary to the last speaker, I don't think that most of these people in this room are refusing to wear masks because they don't care about other people. I think these people do care about other people and a lot. So many people have said, how many people wear masks all over Sioux Falls? 70, 80, some stores require it. Even though it's required, it's not 100% compliance. People take them off. But these people are not mean, hurtful people. They care about other people. In Sioux Falls, we show it every day. You can, no matter what state you go to, what city you go to, whether they have a mass mandate, a shutdown, the, everybody's having a spike, apparently. But 
I appreciate what the council did back in April when I said, let's lead the way and show America possibly how to defeat this thing. The governor's done that. You folks have done that. We've done a good job of it. We're continuing to do a good job of it. To put in a mandate that, that has no penalty, unless it's just a window to another ordinance that has a penalty, is just senseless. These people are taking care of each other. We're working hard. And for, I feel our, all of our hearts go out to anybody who's lost a loved one. But to stand here and demean people, to shame people, to intimidate people, to bully people like these signs right here, I have to point these out. These are horrible signs that are accusing you of being a murderer. That's what those signs are saying. And by, on the top, they're accusing the rest of us of doing the same thing. These people that are talking, they love freedom. These other people that are talking, I don't see the love. I see they want to have intimidation and bullying to get their way. Let's don't pass an ordinance that makes the council and a few people, a few vocal minorities feel better. Let's keep our common sense going in Sioux Falls. Thanks, Bruce. Good evening. Good evening. Brooke Brown. Um, thank you again, Mayor and the City Council, for hearing me and others tonight and extending our time. I appreciate that. Um, and I know you've heard a lot of the same things, so I want to keep mine short and sweet. Um, but even today, as we've heard this new um, mandate coming into play again, we were just here last week, and I just want to talk a little bit about that. You've heard the word liberty a lot tonight, I think. And wasn't our country founded on that principle? And we need to remind ourselves of that. This liberty came and still comes from with, comes with a price. And each one of our God-given rights is to choose this free, in this free country where we live, what faith we practice, what we choose to study and go to school for, whether or not we cover our face with a mask to feel like it's protecting us or not. And last week I talked to you guys a lot about feelings and emotion, and I know you've heard a lot of that, and it's a heavy thing to carry, but it's not something that any of you should be making a decision out of, is emotion. I know that's hard, we're all human, but we need to put that aside. And this practice of avoiding illness is like trying to, to judge raindrops. Eventually you're going to get hit by one. The outcome in most cases though is how strong your immune system is, and I know you've heard this. How strong is your immune system to fight this off? And a strong immune system that is boosted by exposure is the only way to get through life without the use and reliance on an industry that only makes money off of sick people, and that's truly what we're dealing with now. And I just, I want to talk to you guys about tonight, let's start educating on all of these things, not just a mask. Let's go beyond hand washing, social distancing. We've heard it. We know the routine. I think my three-year-old can say it by now. Or even injecting us with a flu shot. Today, the Safer Sioux Falls pledge was put into place. And this was announced, and the primary items were those things on that list to help make our citizens feel safe here in Sioux Falls. Not one measure on there is how to build a strong immune system and educate our citizens on how to do that. But when, when you get the virus, you can know that your immune system is, is going to be strong and what it will do and what it's designed to do. That's why God made our immune systems the way they are. And what about mandating things like Seven hours of sleep, vitamin C, healthy foods, exercising. Mayor, I know you know a lot about that. And those things are the things that are going to help get us out of what we're in right now. And I really just, regardless of where you stand, whether you're on the council or whether you are in this room right now, even the ones that are wearing these masks or have these signs in front of us right now, regardless of where you stand, hear me. I am for you. I believe in your right to make the choice for your body, your face, your health, your beliefs, your family, and yourself. This effort for this pledge and the only changes that I've, that have, that I've seen in this mandate being implemented again shows how political and decisive this is going to be in our city if it's not already. 
These solutions are causing more harm and more deaths and more lost years of life than it is saving us. Many question to all of the, my question to all of you sitting in front of me tonight is that you took an oath to office. for the state of South Dakota and the U.S. Constitution. And one of your jobs is, as an elected official is to inform the public and protect our freedoms, not to make choices out of emotion. I know there are many of you up here sitting here that have loved ones or extended family that are working their tails off in our hospitals. We see that. We, and we honor that. We honor the time that you have put into this as well. But will you, are you going to uphold this oath that you have took oath to? Or are you going to cave to the emotional fear-mongering, just put a mask on it, and just, it's going to create this divide if it hasn't already. I, I've seen it just today as this has been implemented. So right. lastly, thank, thank you, you Mayor Tenhaken and Council. Um, thank you for your boldness last week on your vote. Thank you. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Andrea Glasgow. I'm a health care um, provider as well. I'm a chiropractic assistant, and I do work in this city. And I know I don't come from Sanford, and I don't, I don't come from Avera, and I know we don't have billboards proclaiming our thoughts on this uh, pandemic, but we do have thoughts on this pandemic. I have clinicians that have, um, they have medical certifications, they carry malpractice licenses, they are doctors. They are doctors as well. And people have chosen who their healthcare providers will be. You do not choose who their healthcare providers will be. This is something that is coming down from a different style of medical practice. Um, I want you to be aware of that because while well, you're kind of talking about arguments, and I understand these are not unique arguments that are coming through, I don't believe they're arguments at all. These are decisions. These are practical applications of their information that they receive. Every single person walks up here with proof and facts. These are embedded within their hearts. They, they concave their minds. They force their thoughts forward. And so I don't think that this is going to be a very good thing if we walk forward with one like school of thought to try and work this out. Um, I don't really know what else to say besides that, just that um, you talk a lot about medical officials and our medical providers are speaking to us and giving us information. I think you need to know that that's not everyone's medical providers and that's not everyone's medical physicians. So thank you, just uh, have that in mind ourselves. You can see the divisiveness of all of this. It's because it is such a unique topic. It is such a unique choice. I wouldn't drink what some of you guys are drinking up there. That's what shame feels like, okay? That's your decision, though. I want you to have it, and I want you to let me have mine. Thank you. All right, thank you. Good evening, sir. Hi, um, my name is Logan Thune. Uh, I'm a Christian a husband and a father. I uh, want to start by just thanking you all for serving us in our city uh, in these obviously difficult, trying times. Um, it's been said before, but I think people on both sides of this is issue obviously want what's best for the people of our city. Uh, it's not necessarily a matter of people caring versus, uh, versus people not caring. Um, it's, it's, it's a disagreement on what is most effective with the available data and what's lawfully uh, appropriate. Um, just wanted to bring up three points in regard to the mass mandate. Uh, first, it seems to me that there have been uh, COVID case outbreaks in multiple multiple cities um, and states around us. Um, and of all those states, South Dakota uh, is the only one that hasn't had a lockdown or hasn't had uh, a mask mandate. Um, so the data seems to indicate that the cases are rising despite any of the, the varying policies that have been uh, put in place. Um, so for us to consider a mass mandate in, in Sioux Falls, it seems that it'd be incumbent on the city uh, to show that the rates of our increase are worse or higher than any of these other states that have different, different policies. Um, I think it's been said before, but many people envy the approach that uh, our state has taken to this virus. Um, and so 
Um, looked at the data this morning and we're still at 21% of COVID beds in use and 63% of um, hospital capacity for total beds. Um, secondly, uh, if the city does enact a mask mandate, um, I'm interested in what uh, parameters would be put around that mandate. Um, would we ever review the effectiveness um, if we came back to it four to six weeks from now? Um, would there be a certain case threshold or a certain um, change in the case rate where we say it's not been effective and we're just going to keep doing it? So I guess my question would be what is the um, what's the parameters, what are the specific metrics around it, um, or would the goalposts just keep moving? Um, and lastly, um, if there is no penalty in place for, for non-compliance, um, it's interesting to know uh, what the purpose of enacting the mandate would even be. Um, is it just to intimidate people? Um, I think uh, many people uh, in South Dakota are wearing masks voluntarily. They're doing uh, what they think is best um, for their families. Um, we do have many responsible South Dakotans who um, are doing what they can to, to stop the spread of, of the virus. Um, so I think it's important to respect um, those people um, and let uh, them make decisions for their families. Um, and if, if it's not going to be enforceable, then um, it seems like it's maybe unnecessary. So thanks. All right. Thanks, Logan. Good evening. All right, well, good evening. And, uh, and no disrespect to you, Mayor, I just want to thank you, Star, for extending the opportunity for us to speak. And I recognize State that your name again, sir. I'm Thanks. sorry, Tyler. I got excited. Tyler. So. Yeah. Um, no, I just want to Tyler, thank you for the opportunity. Your yes, full sir. name, sir? Oh, Tyler Bonnage. Okay, yeah. thank you. So, Tyler James Bonnage. My uh, social security number is. No. Um, no, but I do want to thank you for that. I recognize that we perhaps disagree on this, but thank you for hearing me out. So, um, Dr. Alfred Talia uh, states that we're pretty much at capacity. He goes on to say that the hospitals are, quote, managing, but just barely. The hospital's urgent care centers have also been inundated with its outpatient clinics having no appointments available. Dr. Bernard Cummins at the University of Alabama says that the UAB hospital canceled elective surgeries, quote, we had to treat patients in places we normally wouldn't. In California, the LA Times reported of large surge tents set up outside their emergency department because emergency departments had standing room only and some patients were treated in hallways. From Fenton, Missouri's SSM Health St. Clair Hospital opening its overflow wing to pulling nurses from all floors to care for the surge, truly last year's flu season taxed our hospitals. The CDC, the CDC says that the last year's flu season killed 80,000 Americans. Ne uh, nearly 1 million people were admitted to the hospital for ILI alone, that's influenza-like illness. And so the rest of what I'm about to say is going to be in the form of just questions. You know, I, when, when we uh, start considering these things, implementing, I'm sure you had many of these kind of questions. My question is, if masks work, why were they not implemented then? Um, and to kind of reset everything so you know where my heart is on that, um, what I established last week is that I believe that um, I'm not entitled to be, uh, you know, it we should on a personal level be practicing sacrificial things for one one another out of love. I do that you know, in marriage with my kids. And so when it comes to the general populace, I would expect a reflexive nature in that as well. Um, but I just want something that's uh, effective. In my, my thesis statement since last week and has uh, still remains that I don't believe that masks are efficacious towards mitigating the spread of COVID-19. Uh, last week I said that the New England Journal of Medicine said that masks are more like talismans. Uh, who is the New England Journal of Medicine? We, we say a lot of doctors' names and a lot of um, uh, corporations and places that say things, but what is their credentials? Well, the NEJM is recognized as the world's leading medical journal and website. And what is a talisman? Uh, for my sake, I didn't know what it was, but it sounded bad. So uh, it's an object typically inscribed in a ring or stone that is thought to have magic powers. And that was a professional journal speaking on the on masks April 1st, well after the, the Princess cruise ship, um, after seeing Italy, after seeing New York, they still stated this, and again, I, uh, of a, uh, a world-leading medical journal. Um, 
why would the New England Journal describe mass usage outside of medical facilities in this way if they were, um, if they, uh, were an effective strategy to mitigate the virus? Uh, the Great Barrington Declaration is co-authored by epidemiologists from Oxford, Hartford, or not Hartford, uh, Harvard and Stanford, all of which are the top three universities in the world. When their epidemiologists spoke on public policy, they never promoted mask mandates and they vehemently opposed lockdowns of any capacity. Um, if the mask mandates work, if denying masks is on par with like flat earth, if that's what their epidemiologists were promulgating from that kind of platform with that kind of gravity, um, how long would these universities tolerate their epidemiologists going on record as saying otherwise? Uh, the answer is a very low number. And so it's at least something to consider. My, um, as the time wraps up, my, my problem is, I, well, I first want to affirm the, the passion and compassion that this council has on uh, Sioux Falls, and I reciprocate that. I really do. Um, I do encourage uh, that to be manifested in uh, ways that are uh, effective. And my, uh, my issue is that people who are at risk of getting COVID will take the mask and assume a level of protection that they don't have and put themselves in harm's way that they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, and you can see that when masks are instituted where there's spikes and uh, clearly out of time. But I just want to thank you for your time and, and uh, bearing with us in this input. So thank you very much. Thanks, Tyler. Good evening, ma'am. My name is Nakia Hyden. Um, and I'm very, very nervous. This is my first time speaking Sorry publicly. No so problem. please forgive me. I'm just going to read what I had written. Um, I would just like to say good evening, council members and mayor. I always like to start with saying thank you. Thank you for your leadership, your convictions, discernment, open minds, and open hearts. I know that this season is very difficult, especially as leaders, when decisions are placed in your hands and you do not want to let anyone down. My heart and prayers are with you all as I cannot fathom being in your position. I guess the only different stance that I have to offer is that I am technically immunocompromised. I have two sorry, immune disorders. I don't technically look like I do, so therefore when I walk into places and I say that I have a medical exemption, I'm usually turned away or told I need to use online services. Um, this mandate is difficult for me because shields and masks also do, or both of them do the same thing for me. Um, I also have PTSD, and so those things do not necessarily work in my favor, and I cannot always get things online because um, things are in high demand, so therefore I'm losing out on essentials that may be needed for my home. Along with the immunocompromised part, um, I was also diagnosed with asthma at 13. With that said, I am very careful on how I take care of myself. I am vulnerable. When I get sick, I usually get severely ill compared to the rest of my family. So I 100% those in fear of being vulnerable to this virus. I truly, truly do. But I do share the opposite perspective of making it everyone else's responsibility to take care of me or protect me. I take full responsibility for my health. Rigorous hand washing, masking, and social distancing have only weakened my immune system. I have done my research with major studies, independent studies, learning from physicians, and also just personal experiences. It is not natural for my body or anyone's bodies to be in sanitary bubbles all of the time. The more that I sanitize, the more I live and lived in a germaphobe mindset, the more susceptible I have become to illness. That is just one way that I do not support this mandate. Thank you so much for your time and your careful consideration. Okay, thanks, Nakia. Good evening, sir. My name is Chad Wildeborg. Um, I don't agree with the mask mandate. Um, we're America. We're great. Look at where we've come. We're how far we've come. It's pretty unbelievable. Land with the free and home with the brave. When this all started, I was, I was freaking out, worried. Hearing the media, 
hearing everything that everyone was saying, I threw a mask on. I spent money, had a mask sent straight to me, had my kids wearing them. And then you see the numbers. You see that it's not really what they're indicating. There's a lot of freaking out that was happening and still is happening daily. You know, my father-in-law, he works for FedEx. He goes all over South Dakota. He's delivering packages. It's essential. He ended up having a flat tire one day. He happens to be right by this Amish colony. And these nice fellows come out. They pull his truck up. They help him switch out his tires. They actually gave him one. And he was trying to help pay them back. He wanted to give them money. I'm like, no big deal. Either way, he's like, why aren't you guys so worried about all this? Everything that's going on? Because they weren't worried about it. They shook his hand. And he, they return, in return said to him, we don't have the media. That's all I have to say. All right, thanks, Chad. Good evening, ma'am. Can you come up close so we can hear you? Maybe grab the mics. Really and pull. My second time actually ever doing something like that. Sorry. That's right. Glad you're here. All right. What's um, your name? I literally just moved here. What's your my name? name is Elena Kornman. Nice to meet you. I, as a quick background, I'm here from New Jersey. So I went through New Jersey for the last few months, and uh, the tyranny is out of control. However, before this happened was when I began dabbling into politics because I noticed our constitution is suddenly being eroded. Now, um, my background is education and child development. I'm a multi-major. I have um, five teaching certifications that are highly qualified in every subject. So, things like history and stuff start to run through my mind. What I see going on is scary. Um, New Jersey is so corrupt at this point that even like the lawsuits are being overturned. People are being brought in, arrested, and given no due process. We moved here because we want our children to experience America. We're hoping America gets saved. However, a mandate is something you're forcing. Free people should not be forced anything. Okay, this should be a choice. It should be a personal choice. I can tell you right now, you're touching your mask right there. That's a problem. Most masks don't fit, and there is very little evidence actually saying they do very little, okay? Nor doing good at all. I'm sorry, I'm a little shaken because normally I prepare. And I literally was like, this is still going on. I'm gonna get in my car and run down here. <sighs> so, with regards to masks, the current head of OSHA, Aaron Sanchez, wrote a paper. It's um, about the filtration of masks and basically saying that they're ineffective. For the last 40 years, there have been studies on masks regarding the flu virus. Virus, same small size particle as COVID. Now, all of these studies indicate there is very little effectiveness, and that is why at the beginning of this, all, everyone, Fauci, um, Burks, Jerome Adams, all stated it wasn't going to do you any good, right? When you walk around, how many people do you see with a little flap open? You buy these masks, they're one size fit all, somebody sews them, they are not made to work effectively. OSHA has certain protocol where there has to be a certain amount of oxygen in the room for surgeons. Everything is well measured, everything is established in a very safe way. OSHA is being sued right now. You don't hear about it because right now, all the censorship, censorship going on um, and all of the, basically, there's science for both because you can do a study and you could try to say, oh, look what we found and show what you want to show, but it doesn't mean it's good science. So it's very, very important to critically determine whether the results are any good. For example, hydrochloroquine. Many believe it is good. It, it's valid. I got it here when I came here because when I moved here, I brought my father who recently passed from cancer. Okay, I believe the mask pushed him over because we came from New Jersey where he had to work in it for months on end. Anyway, separate thing, if anyone read my email, 
I gave that to you last night by basically casting my story, but my father was a high risk. If I caught anything, he could get, it, it was going to take him out because he was on his way out. We knew it was going to happen. Anyway, my father um, has passed. Whether or not the mask did it, I mean, I'll always wonder. Um, I'm sorry, I got a little distracted with that. But what I just want to say, as free people, we deserve the right to choose. Masks aren't good. And with regards to my experience in New Jersey, I have a medical exemption for a mask. But when you walk in a store and you encounter someone who was told, this is your job, don't let anyone in here, they're going to stand there and do that. They don't care what you say. They don't care. There's nobody there to make sure. It's embarrassing. Okay, I've been in store shopping and I've had people walk up to me and start fights with me. Like, all I want to do is buy my groceries and leave. I'm not sick. I'm no risk to you. You know, how long is this going to go on? Is this just a, you know, does anyone see an end game? Because once you put this mandate, there's supposed to be like a plan. And it doesn't even seem like there's a plan in any of these other places. Not only are they running out of, um, what do you call it? Or, I'm sorry, they're being told that you need to, you know, wear this mask until we get a vaccine. Now you're hearing the vaccine is not actually going to prevent COVID. So it's going to make you an asymptomatic carrier. So the people who will be allowed to then take their mask off will then be allowed to breathe freely and share the virus that was then put into their body. So I'd really like you to think about these things because I can provide any information or science. Thanks, Elena. I can send you studies. Thank you for your comments. Sorry, it was long. <laughs> nope, you're right on time. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Hello. Hello. My name is Kyle Van Hove. Um, I really wasn't planning on speaking, so I'm mostly just going to ramble. Uh, I just kind of came here to, you know, show my support for the mandate. I got my um, mask on. I got my big sign out there. Hopefully, still, I've been in this room for a little bit. Um, feet starting to hurt. Uh, I really didn't prepare anything, so I really just want to talk about personal experience. I mean, speaking as an employee, not a spokesperson, I'm, I work for one of the health systems here in town. I've been working from home since March. I mean, I'm lucky that I can do that, but not everybody is. I have friends who own and operate places here in town and they just want the help. I mean, I would have come here last week to voice my support for the mandate back then too, but I had to quarantine at home. Not because of anything I did or didn't do. My family is always pretty good about wearing the masks. Like I got some hand sanitizer on my coat, you know, but somebody wasn't careful around my family and we caught the virus. That's how it works. Nobody's constitutional rights are being hurt by this. I'm sure you guys are all excellent people. I'm not gonna make a big speech to you like I'm that dude in The Rock who's like, we are protecting from foreign and domestic because that movie's great and dramatic and we don't need to be like overblown here. We know what's happening. Just put your face diaper on, please and thank you so that other people don't have to suffer. I mean, we all talk about, I've heard it a lot here that, you know, all you have to do is just stay home, don't go to these places if you don't want to. Well, you know, two weeks, I've been a big customer of Instacart. Earlier this year, you know, my grandmother wasn't going out of the house. She stayed where she was supposed to be. And uh, about a month or so ago, I attended her funeral in a mask outdoors because she caught COVID. That was it. There was nothing else there. This disease is deadly to people. It's not a question of a slippery slope or all of a sudden we're going to be living in socialist Denmark or whatever the buzzword is. I don't know. As I said, I'm rambling. So just, again, I wasn't planning on speaking, which is why I sound so incoherent. But I just want to say, let's just please do something. Let's have some empathy. If there's a better plan, absolutely. Let's get up here and say, let's do that. But we just need to do something instead of just hoping for the best. Thanks, Kyle. And in conclusion, I just want to be on the city record that uh, The Last Jedi is the best Star Wars movie. Thank you. I, I agree. Thanks, Kyle. Good evening. Hi, Steven Siano. Uh, back to my servants here. Some may have background in law, some may have background in science. I do consider myself to have a background in both. I can cite some. And uh, others have presented 
that politics, as I said before, has taken the place of science. They have spoken of the science involved. So this is clearly a political matter uh, to uh, potentially mandate masks. There is no uh, justifiable reason as I see it, and there's also no legal basis for it. Uh, we've got a history, as somebody just mentioned, uh, Jacobson v. Massachusetts. Um, well, that was back in, uh, well, long before that, um, there was Ex Parte Krause, which uh, started the intrusion into the home uh, under the doctrine of Perens Petraea, which is based on a divine right of kings over their subjects, which was um, declared uh, null and void by the Declaration of Independence. And yet it was covertly imposed in this country. I see an encroachment into our rights in various ways. I stood up for children against the uh, child health education and welfare industry, uh, of which the medical establishment is a part of it. And certainly there are certain industries in this country that are favored uh, amongst them and in the world, amongst them military, which I was a part of and I know something of. Um, and banking and real estate and insurance um, and medicine. Big business and we got to watch where the money's coming from and where it's going. I understand the billions have gone to these companies. Big Pharma controls the, uh, the medical schools, I understand, as well as NAMI. Uh, so look at the source. And uh, like I was saying, I started with, um, well, a lot of money, I understand, has gone into uh, these pharmaceutical companies to create a vaccine. And vaccines are based on fear. The threat is a hoax. The virus is real. I know it. And many of you know it. And the masks are understood to be you know, by medicine, by science, to be ineffectual. Now, surgeons wear masks to keep from spitting in open wounds. Um, <laughs> to walk around 24-7 or however much in, uh, in society with a mask on is absurd. It is a dress code, for, furthermore which makes it unlawful for anyone to uh, uh, legislate. And of course, Will Rogers said, uh, nobody's safe while the legislature's in session. And we have the best uh, legislature money can buy. Um, so, um, I spoke of politics versus science, masquerading as science, previously. Just uh, earlier, I heard a uh, local doctor saying such things as none of us has uh, immunity to this virus. I think a lot of people have demonstrated immunity. I think nine out of 10 that come in contact with it are just fine. Seems that way to me from what I hear. And the CDC is our guide. Well, the CDC has been shown to be uh, untrustworthy. And uh, people are promoting safety. Well, hey, we've got an unseen enemy, you know, an unseen threat. But as I see it, it's not so much any flu virus, which is what it is, and it's changeable. And as it mutates, it cannot be followed with an effective vaccine, as the flu never has been, or the common cold. It's out there, genie's out of the bottle, forget about it. Uh, let's just live with it, learn to live with it, and accept that if there's a higher power, let that power Thanks, choose. Stephen. Good evening. Hello, my name is Abigail Klimchuk, and I just wanted to keep this short and sweet. And you've already hold, heard all the facts, so I just wanted to say that on behalf of the next generation, my generation, I want to keep and preserve my rights. 
My mom and dad came from a communist country and they've told me all the stories and everything they had to go through. And I don't want that to happen to my generation. We are moving slowly towards moving to that kind of communist country the more we place these little ma mandates. They left so I can have my freedom and I want to preserve that. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Bruce Danielson. I've been here listening to this this week, been here the last couple of weeks, and I have a problem with just about every side in this whole discussion. I wear a mask as a personal and social responsibility that I have to have. You all are wearing masks for, I hope, the same reasons. The mandate, as it's written in this, is a, is a social responsibility. It's a discussion point that says to everybody, let's have some kind of social experiment that is based on personal responsibility to do what's right. I have a mother that's in a nursing home right now that has COVID. She's 93 years old. I don't know what's gonna happen to her, but somebody was not socially responsible and brought the disease into that nursing home. I have a sister who's right now going through the lockdown at LifeScape because one of the staff members came in with COVID. That is not something that we know we have until it's too late. I'm wearing a mask because I want to see my sister. I'm hoping that the people that are working with my mother are wearing masks and doing the, the pinpricks, whatever it takes, so they can go to work and take care of her and, and make her healthy. I want to see my mother again. Skirting the, uh, the social responsibility that's built into our Constitution is, sure, you have a personal right to do things, but we are a country. We are the United States of America. We are here because we do things together. We are the greatest social experiment that's ever been on this earth. And I've been listening to people telling me that they can spit in somebody's face and it doesn't matter. And that's starting to really get me ticked off because we have to be socially responsible for each other. My mask is to keep me from spitting in your face. Your mask is to keep, me, keep you from spitting in mine. Look at it that way. I don't want to spit in anybody's face. Though some people think that sometimes that's what I do, but I, uh, I, I have some very strong feelings about that. So I'm wearing a mask. I hope everybody wears a mask. This, this mandate that's being put into the books is essentially worthless because there's no penalty for it, except you feeling guilty that you aren't being socially responsible. As part of this, I tried to get on the city's website today, and everything was crashed. I even tried to make some phone calls into the city offices to find out why I couldn't get to anything. We have a situation where we have to start going back to the primer on South Dakota Public Records written by a former assistant city attorney that clearly spells out the public's rights to information and that you have to follow both state law and ordinance. And South Dakota has a home rule charter that, South, that Sioux Falls has adopted that says we have to do the more stringent law or ordinance. We have no choice. We have the basics of public information that's supposed to be in this room, and that is spelled out here. But 
A couple of years ago, there was a special meeting at the regular time because there was a fiasco on posting agendas and information. And it was decided that on Friday afternoons and at noon on, and I see some smirks going on, and on a, uh, and Monday at noon was the last things could be posted. Today we couldn't get to anything. That's not following public meeting. But I do appreciate, Mr. Clerk, having the book. I have gone through it. I thank you for that because I couldn't read any of this information prior to tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. First of all, you've been very patient tonight, and I thank you for that. Uh, appreciate your time. Two things I want to address specifically in the ordinance, um, the proposed ordinance, enforcement and the urgency. Uh, first of all, uh, we own a small business, uh, much like Jamie was talking about early in the meeting in downtown Sioux Falls. We incentivized customers in mid-July uh, to, to wear masks. It took very little. It, uh, we had better than 85% compliance for a coupon and a donation to a local charity. This fall, we started requiring it. Uh, and that's where I want to talk about the enforcement, because of all the talk about how difficult this is to enforce, we have employees that are in their 20s and in their 60s, women who are enforcing it without issue. So enforcement is not an issue. Our employees could use your backing. They could use the strength of government endorsing a mask mandate. And I, so I appreciate your reconsider, reconsideration of this, but no teeth in it is not backing small businesses. And I'm afraid it might be too little too late. And that's what I want to talk about in the urgency. I've watched government and participated in government for the better part of three decades. Our home rule charter gives you, the city, unique power to do anything not prohibited by the state. It gives our mayor immense power to act swiftly. The council has an emergency clause on this tonight, but you still can't act urgently. It'll be two weeks yet. How many people will die in two weeks? The charter gives the mayor under chapter 33 the power to declare an emergency, call an emergency meeting, and pass. You can bring forth an emergency ordinance that can be adopted and effective immediately upon passage. You can do this tomorrow. So I respectfully ask you, let's not wait. I think the votes are there tonight, and I think you've all made that clear. Let's move it up. Let's use the power that was invested in this government by the people to do it and do it quickly. Thank you. All right, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Steve Johnson. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers the old show Dragnet, Joe Friday. Just the facts, ma'am. Don't want to hear about your feelings, because I don't care. I know people feel strongly about things. So do I. But I like to try and figure out things by the facts. Base your decisions on facts, not emotions. Can you stop this virus? No, it's going to run its course like every virus always does. We sl supposedly were doing pretty good this summer. What happened? Winter shows up. Like every winter, people start getting sick. Maybe COVID, maybe not. Before it was COVID, it was other things. Um, will this mask slow it down? You have no proof of that. So far, all the studies I've heard and seen say that the masks are ineffective. There's no significant difference. Now, there's a big storm coming. Big winter blast. How about if everybody in Sioux Falls who doesn't want to scoop snow takes their fan outside and points it at the storm? That's doing something. But is it effective? Is it going to make a difference? I don't think so. Basic liberties of the people cannot be subordinated to open-ended emergency measures. When's the end for this emergency measure? 
Are we going to wait a week and see what the numbers do? Two weeks? A month? And if that doesn't slow our cases down or the death rate, then what measure do we take? It's the slippery slope we've heard already. I've got something here. It says, the men who waited ashore at Omaha Beach and the women stayed home and built tanks, ships, and planes. In the face of uncertainty, fear, and many cases, certain death, they erred on the side of freedom. So should we. It's the American thing to do. I wish I would have wrote that, but I didn't. I hear a lot of people talking about emotions, but not the facts. And everybody that wants a mask keeps quoting the CDC, and the CDC has been wrong on so many things. Last spring, we were going to have 2.2 million dead Americans. Yeah, we got a lot of dead Americans, but is it from COVID? Last year, we had flu troubles, but were we sticking a test stick up everybody's nose that was dead or dying to see if it was flu? Somebody had a heart attack and fell down. They didn't jam a stick up their nose and say, oh, died of flu. But that's what's happening with COVID. People in car accidents, dead, but they're testing them for COVID. So I would ask you to think about the facts of the matter, not the feelings that you may have about doing something. Because just because you do something doesn't mean it's right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Steve. All right, any other public opinion, testimony on this? Public comment, I guess I should call it. All right, see none, we're going to move on. Um, I got to even remember where we are on this here. So we took that, and I need a motion to approve the ordinance, and then we'll move into the rest of the business. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, go ahead. This is Councilor Sale. I move to approve the motion. Second, Kylie. All right, motion by sale, seconded by Kylie to approve this ordinance. Uh, discussion on this. Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Councilor Sale. I would respectfully I would respectfully ask that we deal with some amendments and then debate the amended motion as a whole. Sounds good. Let's get those on the floor. Do uh, do you want to introduce or Mr. Mayor? Councilor Kylie, I believe you have one issue. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. And if I could just take a, a second to explain the process here. Um, what we're going to be doing is introducing the same amendments that were made last week, and that is just the part of the process of a motion to reconsider. So I'll be making the same motion that Councillor Sale did last week. Councillor Brecky will then make the, and, and we will vote on that. And then Councillor Brecky will make the same amendment that she offered last week, we'll vote on that. And then I will make a new amendment that'll be offered for the first time this evening. So my motion is to amend section one by replacing public place with retail business, facility with business, and striking city-owned facility. In section two, add an before indoor in the first sentence, and replace public places with retail business and city-owned facility. In the third sentence, strike an individual and add an individual in section A and add the following subsections. E, individuals who are engaged in swimming or a team sports activity where the level of exertion makes it difficult to wear a face covering. F, public safety workers actively engaged in a public safety role including but not limited to law enforcement personnel, firefighters, or emergency medical personnel, in situations where wearing a face covering would seriously interfere in the performance of the individual's public safety responsibilities. G, any member of a group of persons who are in a public place together and live in the same household or are a party of 10 or less, so long as the group maintains a continuous physical distance of at least six feet from all other persons, not part of the household or party. In section three, replace for the period of the declared emergency as set forth in executive order number 218 with until January 1, 2021. So 
second sale. All right. Motion by Kylie on all those uh, changes, which are under one amendment, seconded by Councillor Sale. Uh, is there discussion on the council on that? Councillor Nicer, go ahead. I just, I just want the public to know as it relates to this and other amendments, <laughs> my voting for it is because I'm trying to make this thing as weak and ineffectual as possible in case this does passes, or does pass, so don't read my yes votes as supporting this. I want to neuter this as best I can. All right, thank you. Any other discussion, council, on this? All right, let's vote on this First Amendment then. Council members Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Okay, that amendment passes eight to zero, so we're at the main motion as amended. Uh, Councillor Brecky? Motion to amend by adding the following whereas statements. Do you want me to read them or do I need a second first? Uh, we can read them in the record or we can just accept them in the record as presented. If you I'll want to read them, read you them can. In the record. Okay. Motion to amend by adding the following whereas statements immediately after whereas SDCL 9-29-1 and 932-1 confers upon municipalities the power to do what may be necessary or expedient for the promotion of health or the suppression of disease. Whereas pursuant to the authority granted to the City of Sioux Falls, a municipality chartered under Article 9, Section 2 of the Constitution of the State of South Dakota, with all of the powers set forth therein, do hereby invoke those powers as follows, and whereas the purpose of home rule constitutional provisions is to eliminate to some extent the authority of the legislature over the municipality and to bestow on municipalities coming there under full power of local self-government, and as to all subjects which are strictly of municipal concern and not in conflict with the Constitution or the general laws applicable thereto, depending upon applicable constitutional provisions, a charter adopted thereunder may become the organic law of the municipality and supersedes all general state laws in conflict with it relating to purely municipal affairs. And whereas the City of Sioux Falls has adopted such a constitutional charter, which is the organic law for the City of Sioux Falls, and pursuant to Sioux Falls City Charter Article 1, Powers of Cities, Section 1.01, the City shall have all of the power possible for a City to have under the Constitution and laws of this State as fully and completely as though they were specifically enumerated in this Charter. And whereas pursuant to Section 9.04 of the Sioux Falls City Charter and as provided by the State Constitution, laws that are inconsistent or interfere with the effective operation of this Charter are superseded. All right, we have that motion made. Do we have a second for that? Second, Kylie. All right, motion by Councillor Brecky, seconded by Councillor Kylie. Uh, is there any discussion on that one? All right, I'm, I'm hearing none on that. So let's vote on that amendment. Council members Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? No. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Sale? Star? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Make sure we didn't lose them there. We still got them? All right. Let's do this. We're going to, let's take a brief uh, re recess for about two minutes so Tom can take care of that. I know there's a couple counselors who want to stretch your legs and we'll reread the roll call once we get them back online. So take two minutes, stretch, and then we'll revote on that amendment while we get them back online. Welcome to.
This is Councillor Erickson. All right, we uh, we dropped you, so we're dialing you guys back in. We're taking a quick recess here, and then we'll keep going. So okay, I know when it when it cut us off, um, Kurt and I were left on the line at the same time. And Vote. Um, right now, we just have Councillor Sale, Erickson, and Jensen left to vote on this amendment. So we'll continue with the meeting. Yes, Ma yes Mayor. On the on the motion uh, to amend, Sale. Yes. Erickson. Yes. Jensen. Yes. Okay, that passes seven to one. Uh, now I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Councillor Kiley for an additional amendment. Thank you. And this is a new amendment. Motion to add a new section titled no penalty with the following. There shall be no penalty for any person found in violation of this ordinance. All right. Second sale. All right. We have a motion by Kylie, seconded by sale on that. Do we want to have any discussion on that? Councilor Kylie. Just very brief. Thank you. It was never my intention to deal with this, and I mentioned this last week, to deal with this in a heavy-handed fashion. Um, so this... Amendment simply uh, is, is a, uh, a concession that is easy for me to make because it was not my intention to ever penalize somebody with heavy fines or, or even misdemeanors. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, discussion amongst the Council on this amendment to the ordinance? All right. Mr. Mayor. Councillor Erickson, go ahead. 
Um, I do have a couple, um, just because it's about this particular item, um, I do have a couple questions in regards to the no fine and the misdemeanor. I don't know if it's for you or Chief Burns or Stacey Koistra, um, but I'll ask my questions and then whomever wants to respond can do that. I understand the intent is not to have a fine um, with this. My question is, is even though the, the dollar amount is removed, will a person still be charged with a misdemeanor on their record? Attorney Koyster will answer that one, I think. Yeah, Counselor, when the, with the no penalty provision, um, really what you're looking at is, is, is not specific to a fine. And so penalty would really be interpreted broadly. So it, it's not okay. just a matter of what dollars and cents would be associated with that. It would be any penalty in the sense there would not be a, a citation uh, or, okay. or any other prejudice. Uh, including a criminal record or anything of that extent. Uh, no penalty would mean no penalty. Okay, thank you. That, that then clears up my second question was going to be if we can legally remove the court cost or the county portion of the fine, uh, if we're able to do that. But because of your last answer, obviously that would be yes. My last question is what happens if um, someone calls 911? Will someone be dispatched or how will that be handled? Because of no mask wearing. All right. Well, and, and let me just clarify on the other point about the court costs. We really wouldn't be waiving those with no citation. You wouldn't even get to that step. Uh, when it comes to... Right. So That's what I meant. Okay. Sorry. Just making sure I'm, I'm clear on my end. Um, regarding... Yes. Thank you. Uh, law enforcement, of course, they, you know, the law enforcement has a constant duty to provide for the city's public safety. Um, there are any number of other bases for why law enforcement may respond to a 911 call. Uh, that does not mean that they are, would be required to respond to uh, this ordinance uh, because there's no penalty provided uh, in the event that um, a, a business owner, for example, had a, their own personal mask policy, which we're all familiar with the fact that those exist. Um, there's other laws that could apply, anything from disorderly conduct to disturbing the peace to trespass. All those things are available, but generally speaking, law enforcement uh, would not be obligated to respond uh, to an ordinance uh, that's created with no penalty provisions whatsoever. Okay. And one final question, I apologize. Um, this one, I don't know if this is 100% related to the penalty or if this is just as a whole, um, but I feel that it kind of fits into this way. I took several calls today from business owners that said, will we need to enforce this as a business if a patron will not wear a mask? Are they required to ask somebody to leave? Will they be required to enforce it? How, how does that work? I just want to make sure that the messaging is clear for those business owners. If, if a person does come in um, and for whatever reason it may be that they're not wearing a mask, will that have to be enforced by the business? Well, businesses have been already in the practice of enforcing their own mandate, so to speak, in that they can ask people to, to leave. Uh, businesses do not have a duty to enforce the law. Uh, in the event that there are laws being violated in their establishments, they can avail themselves of law enforcement. But again, the, with the language of this provision, uh, with, with this amendment, and the public being on notice that there's no penalty, um, there's not an obligation, frankly, for any misdemeanor for a business to uh, to enforce that on the, on their own. Okay. Well, and, and the, the intent behind the couple of businesses that reached out to me today, it was really their fear of, um, you know, they, they already require it today. Um, they already are saying, Hey, we our employees wear masks. We require it to come in, but they don't want to have a huge altercation with someone that is not either, either way or between patrons. And so the fear was, um, some of that in there. And so I just wanted to make sure that that kind of was discussed tonight as well as, as being on record, um, just to make sure that businesses understand their role. And, and like I said, the ones that did reach out were already requiring masks. They just want to understand the next step of how this would impact them. Um, so, okay, that's all I have for questions. Thank you. 
Councilor well, Neitzer. Oh, if ahead. I maybe maybe add to that, uh, in light of the language that's being proposed here, Councilor, there there would not be any new duty uh, following the passage of this in the event that it passes uh, than there was prior to this. And so, if that's a hopefully a statement of clarity for businesses where this may generate a question, uh, that those duties in effect are unchanged. Councilor Neitzer. Okay, so we've established that businesses have no obligation to enforce this. If, uh, if a private citizen is walking through the mall and they see somebody not wearing a mask, and we talked about this a couple hours ago on the phone, and they call the police, will they respond? They may or may not, depending upon the circumstances. It, based on, on why, why would they, if in it, all they're doing is they're not wearing a mask. They're not being disruptive, they're just not wearing a mask. Nothing else. Well, my expectation is that they wouldn't, or they wouldn't be obligated to under the language of this. Now, now you have to understand that I, I roundtabled this with a number of attorneys in my office and um, to, to, to pass a law and then to have a provision like this for enforcement is a relatively unique thing and speaks to the, the unique circumstances within which we're living right now. Uh, but the facts as presented, um, they would be in violation of an ordinance with no penalty, so there's no recourse in that respect uh, for law enforcement. Now, if the facts would change and they're required to wear masks there by the property owner, then you could have scenarios where there are trespass and it could lead to other things uh, in the event that there's conflict, uh, which obviously everybody would prefer to avoid. In, thank you. In your round table, are you, were you able to come up with, you or your staff, an example of when an ordinance has ever been passed without a penalty? No. You know, th there are other laws, for example, smoking bans and those sort of things, where you're looking more at maybe uh, civil type responses. But generally speaking, there aren't laws like this. But again, you know, for these generations that are present here tonight, it's never occurred within a pandemic before. Okay, thanks. Other discussion on this amendment? All right, hearing none on the amendment, so let's vote on this amendment, please. Council members Kiley? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. All right, that passes 8-0. So we're, we're now to the main motion as it's been amended uh, three times here. Uh, first off, are there any other um, amendments to be introduced? All right, hearing none, we can move into any discussion on the council on this as, as it stands. Uh, Councilor Selberg, go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I jotted down a few comments for tonight. Um, as I've said repeatedly throughout the crisis, I, I believe in following the CDC guidelines. You know, that masks work, we need to keep our space, wash our hands frequently, I think as far as leadership goes. We as a council have preached this nonstop since March. My initial problem with putting this in a mandate were the issues I had with one, no deadline to it, and the endless in issues that could arise when it comes to enforcing it. Well, after countless hours of conversation and compromise, and I want to thank, the, again, the authors of this, um, Councillors Kiley and Sale, for their conversations, as well as other councillors. There's been a lot of discussion and a lot of trying to work this out over the last few days. Um, we've got those two issues. They've been addressed. We will now have a 60-day limit, or we can measure this, and there will be no penalties. So these developments, combined with the pleas that I have received from I would say a good 95% of the medical community. They talk about how they're stretched way too thin, they're at the end of their rope, their belief that this can be a huge help to their effort and that it's certainly worth the effort. And they've been sharing their expertise and their studies that back their argument. This is what is, I guess has pretty much gotten me to the point where we have to give this a try. I'm an educated man. I've taken hundreds of hours of class to get a college degree. I've taken many hours of class to get a my license in real estate, but in all those hours of study, not a one was towards the medical field. So in this position, I find myself relying on the opinion and expertise of those who put those thousands of hours in education and their hands-on experience in that field. To those of you who make the arguments regarding your rights and your liberties, I hear you. 
I'm as big of a keep government out of my face guy as there is. And it's probably only a one in a hundred chance that I would ever find myself supporting something like this. But folks, we're in the middle of a once in a lifetime pandemic right now. And there is no arguing the facts that the numbers are skyrocketing in the wrong direction. I think we've hit that one time in a hundred where we have to do things we never would have thought we'd or imagined that we'd have to do. I would just remind everyone we're not talking about government taking extreme actions as far as they're not trying to squelch your freedom of speech, they're not coming for your guns. We're not recommending or mandating that we have a microchip implanted in our keister so Big Brother can track everything we're doing and everywhere we're going. We're simply encouraging people to make an effort for yourself, for your neighbors, for the community to step up, put a mask on for a couple of months, and let's see if it makes a difference. And for those of you who insist on not doing it, well, you still have your rights, you still have your freedom to choose not to, and you won't be penalized for it. So I would hope we'll give this a shot, and let's pray it prevents us from having to contemplate more drastic measures if the numbers get completely out of control. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Neisser, go ahead. So the, the pleas that I've received, the emotional pleas, which, which are powerful on an emotional level, have said, if you don't do this, if you don't mandate it, if you don't make any, everybody do it, I'm not going to feel safe leaving my home and it's not going to work. What have we just learned tonight? This will have no penalty. Nobody has to enforce it. The city isn't going to enforce it. The police aren't going to enforce it. You know who's going to be stuck reinforcing it? businesses, which they can already do that if they want to. And we're going to have people basically sniping at each other. You're just going to divide the city. The city isn't going to step up. There is... And when I look at this ordinance, people say that we need a mandate. This thing is so full of holes. It doesn't... And I'm not saying I'm for it, but if you are really concerned about mass mandates and believe they work... It doesn't apply to outdoors. It doesn't apply to residences. It doesn't apply to apartments. Best I can tell, it doesn't apply to nursing homes. The absolute most vulnerable population there is. They apparently forgot that. Retirement homes, churches where people congregate. You want to have 5,000 people outside? That's fine. It can be all shoved together. It's not part of this ordinance. Do I believe mass work? Yes, under the right circumstances the right mask, worn properly, fitted properly. I am not a medical professional. I don't know how to wear a mask properly. I don't. And I think that's probably a big part of the efficacy. We look all around the world. It's just common sense. Mask mandates don't work. There's some reason for it. Is it because of the type of mask being worn? Is it because it's ill-fitted? Is it because... You're, we're touching our face all the time. I, I know, I know I've touched my face probably a hundred times tonight, and I'm not even wearing a mask. If I had a mask on, I'd be doing it three times as much, because I'm not trained how to use them, and I, and I do it incorrectly. I talked to somebody in the medical field today, wears masks all the time, and said, you know how much more bang for the buck you would get if you did a public education campaign and taught people how to wear a mask properly? how to do it properly rather than just putting on their dirty mask, touching their face, and then rubbing their eyes. We do things because we're scared and we want to feel good that we're doing something, but it doesn't mean that we're, we're doing something. I, I look around the world, I see it, I, I see the soaring. I, I want to read from Webster's. I had looked this up tonight right before I came to the meeting. Definition of mandate, an authoritative command when there's no authority behind it and no consequence for compliance, is it a mandate? No, it's not a mandate. It's a suggestion. What, what is this any different than what we've already been doing, which is telling you that you should wear a mask? Th this is one of those rare cases where really nobody gets anything out of this deal. If you're against mandates, now you're going to be shamed for it. And if you're for mandates, you're not even getting a mandate because nobody has to follow it anyway. But people want to tell you they're doing something. And I'm going to say it again, I'm not a fatalist. I care about people who are dying, but I also know my limitations. There are things you can do to minimize your risk, but I cannot guarantee that you will not die. I can't, I'm sorry. I may catch the virus and I may die. I don't like it, 
but that's life. And I've learned to accept that there's risk in life, and I'm not going to live my life based on fear. I've, I've told my daughter, you have a better chance of dying in a car accident on the way to school than you do of dying of COVID. That's just a fact. That's just perspective. We have to put things in perspective. I've dealt, I'll, be, I'll be very vulnerable right now. I have dealt with anxiety and panic attacks in the past. It's horrible. And I've learned the tools to deal with it. And I've learned what fear is, false evidence appearing real. It's crippling physically, emotionally. And it's doing these exact things that we're doing now, catastrophizing blowing things out of proportion, losing perspective, all of those things are what is happening. That is not minimizing what is happening to other people. But we are not counting the costs of all of these lockdowns and the horrible, horrible consequences it's having. We're going to put this in place, and it's not going to work. We all know it's not going to work. And you know what? Nobody is going to admit that mass mandates don't work. You know what they're going to say? They're already saying it. You started too late, and you didn't do enough. They're never going to be wrong on this, ever. And we're just going to keep going, and we're going to add something else and something else. We need to figure out how we can educate people. We want an easy solution, and it's, it's just not mass. I, I, and I don't dismiss the 50% of you that are being dismissed as anti-science, political, don't care about other people, and all of this stuff that I've been receiving by email and calls about I'm responsible for all of the body bags piling up, all of this nonsense, I don't accept that whatsoever. Because I know I'm not responsible for a virus. And I know all of you care about people. That's so grossly unfair. Grossly unfair. And that sort of rhetoric, ironically, is so horribly political. It's, it's just, it's totally pot kettle black. I'm going to go back to it. I go to a store. They require a mask. I put it on happily because I, I'm not about confrontation. I figure if I'm, when in Rome, if you want me to wear a mask, I'll wear a mask. I, I question the effectiveness, but whatever. I, I wear a mask. I honor businesses doing that. Businesses have told me, you need to do this so that you back us up. This isn't going to back them up. Because they're going to still be on the front lines and they're going to have to enforce it. And then guess what? If somebody says no, what are they going to do? Get into a new confrontation, call the police, and the police say, well, we're not going to come out. Everybody that's here supporting this wants you to think that they're doing something and they're moving the needle. If you're for mandates, you're not getting anything tonight. If you're against mandates, you're now going to be vilified, looked at, picked at, you might have a very valid reason for not wearing a mask. And you know what? It's none of my business. You shouldn't have to defend yourself. Do what you need to do to protect yourself. Government cannot fix a virus. You're looking for a solution from the city council for a virus. There's some things government can do on a wider range in terms of funding things for vaccines and things like that. You're looking for us to somehow save every life, and it's just not possible. And, I, and with all respect, when somebody says, I'm afraid to go out without a mandate, or I'm afraid, I'm afraid to leave my home, I can't fix that. That's a deep thing. That's a deep emotional. That's deep in your heart and your soul. No mandate is going to fix that. And I feel really sad about that, because like I said, I, I've, I've dealt with this, not dealing with COVID, but dealt with that struggle in the past. And it's crippling, and it's no way to live, and, and I, I will not live a life in fear. It's not about being reckless, it's about taking reasonable precautions, but you can make the best decisions. We've beat it into your head, all of the things you should be doing. Everywhere else is soaring, and nobody else, and, and they've had mandates for what, months and months and months. You saw all these charts but we're just going to do it because we've just been basically emotionally blackmailed into, you've got to do something. And so I, I'll stop there, but I, the, the reason that South Dakota and Sioux Falls have been different is we've taken a different path. 
We are on the cusp of throwing all of that away. All right. Any other discussion, Council, on this? Councilor Jensen, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate um, the conversation that we've had tonight and over the past three weeks. And what I'll tell you is um, I texted a, a buddy of mine who is an ER doc and lives this every day, limited government guy just like yourself, just like me, just like a lot of us up here. And what he said is we're drowning in the ER. Um, if a room can have two beds, it has two beds. If um, there were two open beds uh, a Thursday ago, and those beds were filled by 7 a.m. Uh, is continuing on as a Thursday. You know, our numbers aren't even high on a Thursday. I think as we look at this, you know, quick stopgap measure in, in the masks and uh, what we're doing here tonight, we have to look at this plan and plan more comprehensively. We have to actually figure out what the ICU beds are here in Sioux Falls, because if that's the story we're hearing from our emergency rooms, I think it is you know, our duty to help and work and make resources available uh, for our emergency rooms, because it's not only the COVID patients that I'm concerned about, but what I'm concerned about is, let's say I get in a car accident, like the former speaker just said, that I guess I'm more likely to die of. I want to have an abundance of health care. We've heard from our ER doctors. We've heard from our nurses. It's a workforce problem. There's, there's not enough workforce uh, in our ERs in Sioux Falls. And, you know, I'm going to vote for this uh, tonight as I've done the research and alternative facts have been presented to me and over and over and over again, uh, we've seen this happen. And I would encourage us not only to vote this forward, but I'd encourage you, Mr. Mayor, and your authority to put all the resources that Sioux Falls has behind uh, figuring out a better plan for how we move forward. Uh, because I do agree that this is only a quick stop gap measure, measure. We have to get our arms and our, you know, uh, our plans uh, developed around this. Uh, and if we do that and we succeed at it, great. That's outstanding. And we'll roll all this back and get it off our books. And it, you know, it, it comes off the books at the end of the year. But let's try it. Let's advance on this, you know, common en enemy, uh, this, this virus. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Other input from the council or discussion on this item here? Mr. Mayor. Councillor Sale, go ahead. Yes, yeah, just a couple of quick points that uh, roll back to what Councillor Kiley said to start this discussion. That we never intended this to be a punitive measure upon those people. And we took into consideration the little bit of pushback we got about enforcement and the fines and stuff. They entered into discussion with other counselors to go ahead and roll that back to, to address this pandemic. Now, nobody says that masks are a silver bullet that will take care of this. As we continue to push forward, and later on tonight we'll vote on some expenditures to do that, we need to educate our public about the rest of it too. So as we come to a vote on this, I do appreciate the conversation I've had with the council on this, the administration, the staff, to try and come up with a reasonable plan for Sioux Falls. And I think we've done that by making the exceptions for sports and, and, the, and those people that do have a medical condition. We, could, we want to be compassionate on this. But just as Councillor Jensen just said, our health care systems are overwhelmed. And when we started this discussion about COVID way back last spring, March, it was all about making sure that we did not overwhelm our healthcare systems. Well, right now in Sioux Falls, they're reaching that critical spot, as Councillor Jensen just said, that if you're in a car accident, we want to make sure there's a bed for you there and you can get treated. So while this is not a silver bullet, I do believe it's a step in the right direction. And I urge my fellow council members to vote for it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councillor. Other discussion on the council? On the uh, motion, or the, yeah, the motion is amended. All right, Councillor Kiley. Thank you. Well, 
Councillor Selberg and, and Jensen, first of all, I'd like to thank them for reconsidering this very important issue. It's great that we've had the ability to have this discussion. Whether we agree with one another or not, we are in a democracy and you have the right to be heard and have your opinion and I respect that. And even though that my opinion may vary from yours, we are here tonight. I'm, I'm here interested in the health and safety of the Sioux Falls citizens. And I think that this is a measure that will assist in that. That's what I care about. It's not about power, it's not about anything else. I, I do, we, we've heard time in again that our hospital systems, our medical providers are just stressed beyond stressed. And I think it's time that we respond to them. South Dakota State Medical Association now has, has backed this measure as well as Avera Health and many other individuals throughout, throughout this city. So I, I think we do owe it to them. And in many cases they pleaded, if you could just reduce our workload maybe 5%, or if you could slow down the increase just by a few percentage points, that would be a win. As was discussed, this isn't the silver bullet, and, and no, masks are not going to uh, prevent everything or prevent the spread of this, but it is effective 70% of the time, whether you're wearing the mask or you're not wearing the mask. And I do believe the medical experts on, on this, and so I, I will base my opinion on what I'm receiving uh, from our medical experts locally as well as, as nationally. And I do believe it's a measure that will help to keep our businesses open too and our schools open as well. I mean, that's important to the economy of the city. And as I've said, this is the least restri restrictive measure available to us right now. And we've made it even in more so. So I do hope that my fellow counselors consider voting yes on this measure. And thank you. And it's, it's not a measure that any of us want to make but it's a measure that I feel at this point in time is necessary. All right, thank you, Councillor. Any final discussion on the council before I call for the vote here? All right, hearing none, let's take a vote on this, please, Tom. Council members Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? No. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? No. Jensen? Yes. All right, that item passes six to two, and we'll move on to item 21. Item 21, second reading, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, authorizing the issuance of its wastewater system revenue bond in one or more series to the South Dakota Conservancy District, authorizing the use of the proceeds thereof for capital improvements, pledging the wastewater system revenue of the city to the payment of said wastewater system revenue bond, fixing the terms of such wastewater system revenue bond, authorizing the execution and delivery of a loan agreement between the city and the South Dakota Conservancy District, and authorizing the execution and delivery of such wastewater system revenue bond to the South Dakota Conservancy District, not to exceed $18,500,000, sponsors the mayor. Mark, good evening. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. Thank you for having us. I also have uh, Doug Hayek with us. He's our bond counsel. Uh, in brief, uh, we did a presentation on this at first reading last week. Uh, just to remind you of the key points of this, this is loan two of four that will fund the wastewater expansion improvements at the plant. Uh, the, ter the amount of this loan is $18.5 million. It will have a 20-year term at a 2% interest rate, and we are here to answer your questions. All right. Thank you, Mark. Anyone from the public would like to speak to this item tonight? All right, Council, you have any questions for Mark or for Doug, who's here? All right, look for a motion on this item then. To approve, Brecky. Second, Neitzer. All right, motion by Brecky, seconded by Neitzer to approve this one. Any discussion, Councilors? All right, hearing none, let's take a vote, please. Council members Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen. Yes. 
All right, that passes eight to zero. Move on to our item 22, please. Item 22, second reading, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, providing supplemental appropriation to fund the COVID-19 public health education campaign in 2020, health $20,000. Sponsors, council members, Brecky and Sale. All right, uh, Councillor Brecky or Councillor Sale, you want to speak to this item? I will speak to this item. All right, floor is yours. This is, um, this is really a, an attempt to take a more holistic approach to the process we're in. Councillor Jensen just talked about that. We need to wrap our arms around all of the issues and kind of, come, uh, kind of try to address it as best we can comprehensively. And what I see this is the beginning of a messaging campaign so that we can do a better job of communicating you know, directly with the entire city as we move forward. And so this ordinance will, you know, will give an additional $20,000 to the health department to immediately begin you know, working on an advertising campaign um, individually or with whomever they want to join as partners in order to educate the public as we go through this crisis um, and, and as the issues change, um, the things that we need the public to help us do to help us survive during this pandemic. And so this is for $20,000 now. And I think there's one later uh, um, on the or later in the agenda that will um, provide for an amendment. Well, actually, we moved that last week for a second reading on January 5th, which will provide another $100,000 in the uh, 2021 budget um, so that we can continue the message as the message changes. Right now, we probably need messaging about masks. In the future, we may, may need to have messaging about vaccines. There's just going to be, need to be a stream of messaging, and I think there should be a stream of funding to go with it. So that's the purpose of this second reading of this ordinance. All right. Th thank you, Councillor. Anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item tonight? Good evening. Ms. Danga, I guess I'm having problems trying to uh, get a handle on $20,000. I think that we have already educated people on what they have to do. I think this last four hours with all the people in this room have educated every single person that's watching this on TV. People know that they have to stay six foot away. People know that, well, does masks work? Do they not work? That's your choice. You got to wash your hands. You got to sanitize, whatever. I've walked up to this podium and I've watched Hundreds of people come up to this podium and not one time did we wipe it down. So are we really worried about what COVID-19? Anybody in this room could have had it, but yet we didn't wipe this down once. But we're so frantic about it. And then we're going to spend 20000 and then we're going to spend 100000 Jesus, why don't we just spend a million? Because there isn't enough money in the world to educate people on what's going on because they already know. You guys got them underneath their bed. They're afraid to come outside. Why don't you guys go out in the real world and deal with people and listen to people that are hiding in their bedrooms because they can't go outside because they're afraid they're going to get sick. You took your mask off half of the time. You couldn't even keep it on because, and you're trying to think we're going to keep it on? Come on, people, get real. Anyone else to speak on this tonight? Steven Siano. Once again, I think we need to look at the money. Follow the money. And we need to look at medical scientific reality versus the politics, which follows the money. And we need to recognize the law. Um, this is one step toward a, virus, a uh, vaccine mandate, and uh, that scares a lot of people in the know. Look at it, look at the history of our vaccines injuring people and being uh, not efficacious. Uh, that is big business though, covering it up. Remember, Congress passed the law, you can't sue the uh, vaccine manufacturers or those who inject such poisons into our bodies. I refuse to allow my children to be vaccinated, and uh, I recommend the same to all 
and the flu virus this is. Stephen, this is about a marketing It never campaign. works. Okay, thank you. All right, anyone else here to speak on this? Please come forward. Kathy Sherman, um, I'm not really here to speak on it, but I was just wondering, will we get a breakdown of where that money, like an accountability? Because uh, I like everybody else, wash your hands, wear a mask, stay six feet apart. Uh, so the education, I just was personally, I would like a breakdown of that. It, it, if, you know, will that be available to us, the, the public? And that's... Thank you. Question. Anyone else here to speak on this item tonight? We don't respond to public input, so I'll finish taking public input first. Anyway, okay, and then we'll uh, look for a motion and then we can move into discussion. Do you want to make a motion, Councilor Brecky, on your item? Move to approve, Brecky. Okay. I have a second for second this? Second sale. All right, second for Councilor Sale. Discussion on this item. Councilor Brecky? I will respond to the public input just briefly. I did talk with the Department of Health about this, and they will be giving a public report after they've spent it, just telling us how they spent it and how they're able to utilize it. Um, and then I, I did also ask them at that time if they would give us an outline as to what ideas they have, uh, you know, for how they're going to, you know, utilize the 100000 And But that will be, you know, in January. All right, thank you. Any other discussion, Council, on this? Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, one of the things I just wanted to touch base on, uh, as we've talked about marketing for um, all the different COVID-related things, I think Councillor Knights brought up a great point of appropriate mask wearing, as well as, hey, if you've got a pending COVID test, you have got to stay home. I think that that's lost a lot along the lines. The other thing that um, I did have the conversation with um, Deputy Chief of Staff Erica Beck, as well as a few other counselors, that this council, along with the administration, when our numbers did come to a lull, um, we, we thought, oh, well, we might be through part of this, and now we're seeing a spike again. Uh, we did launch a, a large campaign of Sioux Falls Alive, Experience Sioux Falls. I know a lot of you see commercials on TV about it. Um, but the timing of that is not right. Um, I talked to Erica about that. I know Kurt Sale reached out to Terry Schmidt and talked about that as far as, hey, can we pause that campaign? We certainly want to let everybody know that we're open for business when the time is right. Um, but if we're discussing mandates and we're discussing all these things that we need to do um, to take the pressure off of the healthcare system, the last thing that we need to be doing is advertising, hey, everybody go out for dinner, go do this, go do this. And so my hope is, is that that program will be paused uh, upon talking to a few folks. Um, they did mention that that will be paused until after Thanksgiving and reevaluated. I certainly do support advertising for Sioux Falls and making sure that we are taking care of those small businesses. But we need to do it on the appropriate timeline. Um, I know a few others share my same uh, sediments with that, but we need to be mindful of that as we move forward with um, spending money on educating people to wash their hands, but hey, why don't you come to Sioux Falls and um, have a weekend here and, and play outside and do whatever. So I just think, uh, just when it mentions that we need to be pausing that program for a while until we can get things under control. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. Other discussion on this item here? Uh, Councilor Neitzer, go ahead. In the abstract, I like the idea, but I guess the only thing I struggle with is exactly what we might use it for, because I, I think most people are very aware about washing your hands and social distancing, and, and so when we get bang for buck, the buck out of that, I, I guess to reiterate, I, I, I wish we would launch a public education campaign on if you're going to wear a mask, here's how to do it and, and, and how to do it effectively, and we could move the needle. I, I'm not sure... That's the direction that we're going, however. All right. Thank you, Councillor. Any other discussion? All right. Let's take a vote on this, Tom. Council members Kiley? Yes. Neitzert? No. Selberg? No. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? No. Jensen? Yes. All right. That item passes 5 to 3. Move on to item 23, please. Item 23, first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City by amending Chapter 39, Personnel Regulations and Benefits, Retirement and Pensions, 
Section 39.183, Maximum Balance and Payment. Recommendation set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. Sponsors the Mayor. Angie, you up on this? Thanks for hanging out with us tonight. Good evening, Angie Yuffie with Human Resources. I'll give you just a little bit of background on this uh, recommendation we have for an ordinance change is actually to remove the limitation um, for carryover of our vacation balances for the Chapter 39 employees. Um, we also have, you'll be receiving at the first meeting in December, three memorandums, MOUs, for the three labor unions. That coincides and says the exact same thing uh, because we'd like to treat all of our employees exactly the same in relationship to this issue. All right. Thank you, Angie. Yes. Anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item here? All right, counselors, do you have any questions? Go ahead, Councillor Neiser. So just to be clear, at least uh, for the longest time where I worked, we had vacation balances and, and you could max out and you had to have it under a certain threshold at the end of a year. Otherwise, you forfeited it. It went down to the cap or whatever. Um, now we're flexible, so we don't have that. But it, we're essentially waiving that cap. Like, for example, if their cap is 100 hours, they can have 150, and they have until the end of what, the next calendar year to get it down? That's correct. They can have until the end of, of December, till December 31st of 2021 to bring that cap back down. Um, because we've had a lot of uh, people who were not able to use their time off this year due to staffing issues related to COVID. And so we want, don't want to have everybody lose that time mm -hmm. necessarily. Um, and we want to give them an opportunity to take that time off if they can in 2021. Um, it does not impact uh, any payouts. If someone were to retire in 2021, they are only eligible for the maximum payout uh, that is currently on the books. That okay. does not change. Great. Well, in addition to that, it's been very difficult to travel. It's just, That's uh, or, or you don't feel comfortable. So that seems very fair. Thanks. Other questions for Angie, Council? All right, look for a motion on this item. Move approval. Second, Jensen. All right, motion by Selberg, seconded by Jensen to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1 on this. Uh, discussion, Council? All right, hearing none, let's vote, please. Council members, Kylie? Yes. Heitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Dale? Yes. Star? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. That passes 8-0. Next item, please. Item 24, first reading, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located at 3635 West Platinum Point, place from the RD2 Townhome Residential Suburban District to the RA1 Apartment Residential Low Density District, number 13119-2020, and amending the official zoning map of the city of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 4-0. to zero. Recommendation set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. Private applicant, Lloyd Companies, Drew O'Brien. Albert, good evening. Evening, Mayor Council. Albert Schmidt, CC Falls Planning Office, here to present for you. Applicant owner on this one is Lloyd Companies, located at 3635 West Platinum Point. That's uh, along Louise Avenue near Harrisburg Elementary, or Explorer Elementary, excuse me. It's about 4.53 acres. And the purpose of this one is to correct existing zoning based on the existing land use. No changes are planned at the site physically at all. Uh, anyone from the public would like to speak to this one? Councillors, do you have any questions for Albert on this? I'll move to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. Second. All right, motion by Knights or seconded by Kylie on that. Any discussion, Council? All right, let's vote on that. Council members, Kylie? Yes. Knights, sir? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Benson? Yes. Right, that passes eight to zero, item 25. 25, first reading an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located at 705 South Lovell Avenue from the I-1 Light Industrial and RS Single Family Residential Suburban Districts to the RD2 Townhome Residential Suburban District, number 13153-2020 and amending the official zoning map of the city of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval four to zero. Recommendations set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. Private applicant, LifeScape, Richard DeSanto. So yes, uh, this location here is located at 705 South Blavelt Avenue, approximately 0.6 acres in size. 
and the purpose here will be to construct a community residential home with two sides of four bedrooms per side, and the site will need to meet our floodplain standards at this location as well, to be noted. Right, Looking for a second reading. Thank you. Thanks, Albert. Anyone from the public want to speak on this item here? Councilors, do you have any questions tonight? Move approval. Second, Kylie. All right, motion by Selberg, seconded by Kylie to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1 on that. Any discussion here? We'll take a vote, please. Council members, Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Okay, that passes eight to zero. Item 26. Item 26, first reading an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located at the northwest corner of North Ellis Road and West Dockside Drive from the pedestrian oriented PUD, PO PUD district to the RD2 townhome residential suburban district number 13155 2020 and amending the official zoning map of the city of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval for zero. Recommendation set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. Private applicant, Jans Corporation, Dale Jans. This is located at north of West Dock Drive and west of South Ellis Road. It's at the empty land along the lake on the northeast corner here. As you can see, this size is approximately 4.62 acres, and the purpose is to build single-family, twin-family, and townhome sites here. This POPUD section is the last remaining portion of the old PUPUD, which did not get constructed that way due to market conditions, and so we're recommending for approval on the rezone. All right, thanks, Albert. Anyone from the public here to speak on this? Councilors, any questions on this one? Councilor Neitzert? As you noted, this, is, this entire subdivision has changed into residential and continues to go that way. Uh, there has been a little bit of concern raised from, from a few that live out there about, about the uses, but maybe it would help if you told us what could be done with the POPUD now. Sure. As compared to... This. So right now in the POPUD, uh, as long as they came through with the National Development Plan to go through the process, they could pretty much do uh, higher density stuff. So you're talking apartments, you're talking condos, you're talking commercial uses, all that could constructively be put together in this area to be done. Um, with the small amount of area remaining, that would be tough and hard to do physically, and the purpose here rezoning to more single-family uses we feel fits in pretty well. And again, what could be zoned technically in a POPD could be much more dense than what they're proposing here. Thank you. And I'll make a motion to set a second reading for December 1st, 2020. Second. All right. Motion by Neitzer, seconded by Selberg. On that, any discussion, councilors? Let's vote on it, please. Council members, Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Recky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. That item passes 8-0. Next item. Item 27, first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located at 1312 North Archer Drive from the RS Single Family Residential Suburban District to the RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban District, number 13179-2020, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 4-0. Recommendation set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. Private applicant, G&D, Har Construction, LLC, Gary Har. Yeah, at this location again is 1312 North Archer Drive, just south of Cleveland Avenue and uh, Rice Street there. So you can see the lot here uh, just the other year. We rezoned the lot just to the west of this, the same exact thing. They're looking to build another twin home at this location, same builder, same owner. I'll take any questions you may have. Thanks, Albert. Anyone from the public here to speak on this one? Councilors, questions for Albert here? All right, look for a motion. Set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1. Move to approve. Second, Neitzert. Right. Motion by Kylie, second by Neitzert on that. Any discussion, councilors? All right, let's vote on that, please. Council members, Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. All right. Passes 8-0. Next item. Item 28, first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located at 812 South Grange Avenue from the RS Single Family Residential Suburban District to the RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban District, number 13187-2020, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 4-0. Recommendation set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. Private applicant, Bluegill Properties, LLC, Blaine Fatma. 
Yeah, this is located again at 812 North or South Grange Avenue here, just northeast of the Sanford Hospital main campus. It's approximately 0.16 acres. And the purpose here is to actually take the single family house and convert it into two units. So you can see at site here, they do have parking in the rear for a couple spots and such. So we've recommended approval and looking for second reading. Thank you. Thanks, Albert. Any uh, one from the public want to speak on this? Councilors, any questions here? Move approved. Second. All right. Motion by Kylie, seconded by uh, Councilor Selbert. Set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1. Any discussion on that? All right. Let's take a vote, please. Council members, Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. All right, that passes, eight to zero. Next item. Item 29, first reading, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located at 4201 North Marion Road from the RA2 apartment residential moderate density district to the RD1 twin home re duplex residential suburban district. Number 13189-2020 and amending the official zoning map of the city of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval four to zero. Recommendation set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. Private applicants, Hazel Tyne Partners, LLC, Steve Van Buskirk. So yeah, this one is located just south of West 54th Street North and west of North Marion Road, about half a block. This is just south of the University Hills development up in that area on the town, kind of um, way southwest of the north side Walmart. The size is 3.45 acres, and the purpose here is to switch it over so that they can actually build twin homes at this site that will fit in more uh, with the existing twin homes already built to the southwest there. All right, thanks, Albert. Anyone from the public here to speak on that item tonight? Councilors, any questions here? All right, let's uh, get a motion for a set of uh, set of data second reading for Tuesday, December 1. Anyone? I will make that motion. Second, Thanks, sir. Great. Jensen. <laughs> Great. Nice, sir. We'll make the motion. Seconded by Jensen. Any discussion? All right, let's take a vote. Council members, Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Recky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. All right, that passes, 8-0, item 30. Item 30, first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located south of East Madison Street and North Willow Creek Avenue from the RS Single Family Residential Suburban District to the RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban District, number 13190-2020, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 4-0. Recommendation set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. Private applicant, Six Mile Partners, Steve Van Busker. This is located south of East Madison Street and east of North Six Mile Road, just north of the Sam Assam Elementary School. The size is approximately 4.4 acres in question here. And the purpose in this area, you can see that area on the north side of that road along East, uh, east Madison Street, is to allow twin homes to be built along an arterial street in that area, which is very common in our planning side. We recommend approval. Looking for a second reading. Thank you. Thanks, Albert. Anyone from the public would like to speak to this? All right, any questions, Council? Move approval. Second, second. Jensen. All right, motion by Selberg, seconded by Jensen, to set a day of second reading for Tuesday, December 1. Any discussion? We'll take a vote. Council members, Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Hey. Yep. Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. Item 31, please. Item 31, first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located at 100 East 85th Street from the C2 Commercial Neighborhood and Streetcar District to the RA1 Apartment Residential Low Density District, number 13194-2020, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval four to zero. Recommendation set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. Private applicant, MK Investments, LLC, Erica Malali. Last but certainly not least, we have this one located north of West 85th Street and west of East Clearwater Place, uh, which will be actually just to the east of where Future Veterans Parkway, which is phase one of the next uh, construction side of the south side, will go. So you can see that here on the area to the there. They own the apartment complex to the north and looking to basically do the same exact thing there um, with villa style twin homes uh, classified as apartments by our zoning side of things. Recommending for approval. Thanks, Albert. Anyone from the public here to speak on this? Councilors, any questions here? 
All right, look for a motion to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1. So moved. Neitzert. Second. Kylie. All right, motion by Neitzert, seconded by Kylie on that. Any discussion? We'll take a vote, please. Council members Kylie. Yes. Neitzert. Yes. Selberg. Yes. Sale. Yes. Starr. Yes. Brecky. Yes. Erickson. Yes. Jensen. Yes. That passes 8 to 0. Item 32. Item 32, first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, repealing Ordinance 89-20, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, authorizing the mayor to sign the underground electric easement and agreement and to grant an easement to Northern States Power Company within McKinnon Park. Recommendation set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. Sponsor is the mayor. Stacy. Yes, Mr. Mayor, this is, uh, this is an ordinance that seeks to repeal this in... Uh, and the subsequent ordinance are actually sort of, uh, are related. Um, item 32 is a repeal of the previously approved ordinance related to the power line for the small cell located in McKinnon Park. At the time it was drafted, it was understood that the, the owner and power provider would be NSP, uh, when in fact it actually be Verizon. So uh, this would repeal uh, the original ordinance referencing Northern States Power Company and the uh, subsequent one will provide that it would be uh, Verizon. And, uh, with that, I'll take any questions. All right. Thank you, sir. Anyone from the public here to speak on this item? Councilors, do you have any questions here on this one? Look for a motion to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Kylie, seconded by Selberg on that. Any discussion? Let's vote, please. Council members Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Recky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. That passes 8 to 0. Next item. Item 33, first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, authorizing the mayor to sign the underground electric easement and agreement and to grant an easement to ComNet Cellular Incorporated doing business as Verizon Wireless within McKinnon Park. Recommendation set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. Sponsors the mayor. Stacy. Anything different on this? Nope. This is the companion ordinance that just uh, it corrects it. I'll just inform you that the reason there's a repeal in, uh, in this is for purposes to ensure that the erroneous uh, one wouldn't be filed at the Register of Deeds with an amendment. This just makes it cleaner for the record for the Register of Deeds. All right. Anyone from the public would like to speak on it? All right. Councilors, any questions or can I get a motion on it? Move to approve. Second, Jensen. All right, motion by Kylie, seconded by Jensen. That's a set of data. Second reading for Tuesday, December 1. Discussion? Let's vote on that one. Council members Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yep. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0, item 34. Item 34, first reading, an emergency ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, adopting business regulations pertaining to the novel coronavirus, COVID-19. Recommendations set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. Sponsors, Council Members Brecky and Starr. All right, Council Brecky, floor is yours. Um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, again, I, I, what I'm interested in doing, and, and I think it all kind of fits together, is basically I'm trying to take my guidance, and I know some of the other Council Members have talked about it tonight, you know, from our major healthcare organizations. And the World Healthcare Organization last week said cities take measures to reduce the spread now. I mean, that was the message that was coming from the World Healthcare Organization. And of course, it was last week that we had the first uh, discussion of the mask mandate. But in addition to that, I think we need to look more at the other kinds of things we can be doing and again, try to take a holistic approach to what we're doing. And so that's why I recommended that we have some money set aside so we identify a, a funding stream for messaging throughout the duration of, the, of COVID. And then also, I'd like to talk, I'd like to reintroduce um, the no lingering ordinance that we used back in May when we were trying to mitigate the spread at that time. So basically what I was looking at are those measures that have always already demonstrated their ability to work for us. So when we first embarked on this adventure, um, that was one of the things that we utilized to flatten the curve. And, and we did have some success with that at that time. And so I, and, and when we did um, 
release it, if you will, or, or, or cease, cease it, I don't know if you call it repeal it, whatever, we stopped, stopped it. We did say at that time that, you know, should, those, should we start seeing some sudden spikes, we might want to revisit that issue. So that's really what I'm doing. I'd like to revisit that issue. I'd like to bring it back up for a first reading, you know, tonight, and then have a second reading, which would be on December 1st. That gives us two weeks to see what's going on before we actually would pass it again. But we're hitting, we're going to hit the holidays, and there's going to be a desire for people to get out and about and go shopping. And the other thing I was responding with in bringing this forward was not just the National Health Care Organization, but the CDC. And the CDC has said, you know, when, when, as far as the kinds of measures that you take to reduce the spread, um, two of the most effective are mandating masks and closing down bars, restaurants, and gyms. Well, our no lingering ordinance doesn't close them down, but it does ask them to ratchet it back. And, to, and, and requires, you know, it limits the capacity to a certain extent, and it, it requires some social distancing. So this is the exact same ordinance that we've already passed at one time and utilized effectively. I made no changes to it because I didn't see any need for it. It worked once. I'm bringing it back in the hopes that it may work again. Um, we're not passing it. We're just passing it on for a second read, seeing where we are at that juncture. And if our numbers continue to spike, um, particularly since we just passed a mass mandate that maybe isn't the strongest measure. And so it's questionable how effective that's going to be. So um, that's what I'm bringing forward. Um, in addition to that, you have before you a resolution. And I want you to just take a look at that. It's in draft form, and I also had it available for the public. Because what I'd like us to take a look at in the next meeting as well um, would be a resolution suggesting that the mayor and his staff, you know, develop and implement a stimulus package, you know, for these businesses that are going to be affected by the lingering ordinance and any other, other of the measures that we're taking uh, so that we can utilize, you know, some of the funding that we have in order to, um, you know, create a, uh, um, you know, some, use some money to stimulate, you know, our business activity and our economy. So, for me, I was trying to look at it in a holistic way, and what I came up with was those four things. You know, one, begin, a, you know, begin an appropriate message, messaging stream, you know, that was publicly financed. You know, adopt the no lingering ordinance if the numbers warrant it two weeks from now. Implement a financial stimulus program. You know, impl implement a mandatory mask ordinance. And so um, I, I'd like you to kind of be reviewing those all together, but that's what I was thinking of in bringing this forward. I would really hope that you would um, uh, pass it to a second read so we can see where we are. Again, if the numbers don't warrant it, um, you know, we simply don't have to reinstate it. But if the numbers warrant it, uh, I think it could be very useful um, at that time to just add another layer of, of government involvement that will help reduce, uh, reduce the spread of COVID, which is, I think, what we're being asked to do by the World Health Care Organization and the, the CDC. All right, thank you, Councillor. Uh, we'll move on to public input. Anyone have public input on this item? Speak three minutes per person, come forward. Yeah, we're starting to falls. So we're not closing the businesses, but we're, we're restricting them. We have businesses that, y'all for the business people, right? So we have millions of dollars invested in properties couple hundred thousand he pays in property taxes. So he's gonna need thousands on top of thousands for the city to help him keep funded. Then we have a, a, another business owner that is not as big as the other one, but he still pays property taxes anywhere from 50, 60,000, $70,000. So we wanna keep these people in business. Now mind you, when we had that lingering ordinance, we had business owners that committed suicide three that I know of, hung yourself, and two, shot yourselves in the head, because they had mortgage payments. So we're gonna have deaths, we're gonna have suicide crisis here, because these individuals don't matter if they're rich or poor, middle class, they still have to pay mortgage payments. None of their properties are paid. We're not talking about shenanigans, where shenanigans said, close the place, I can afford to um, 
uh, pay my, my, my people, my employees. Well, not everybody has the money that Shenanigan's owner has. These are not multi-million uh, dollar people here. They're trying to make a living. So I think if y'all having a crisis over COVID, we're going to have people being buried because they shot themselves in the head or hung themselves because they cannot afford their mortgage payments here. So bankers, landlords, y'all all for the business people, how are they going to pay their mortgage? The banks are not going to hold and say that don't pay your mortgage payment for five, six, seven months. That's not going to happen. They're going to pick up that property. Same thing for gambling. Some of them have gambling machines. Not everybody owns their gambling machines. They got to pay for that. The state got to make their money on, on those gambling machines also. So I think we're going a little bit too far with this mask mandate and then these business people here. We're going a little bit too far. So a couple hundred thousand dollars that he has to pay in property taxes and he has his overhead in that. How, how in the hell is council going to give him that money? Uh, I'm, I'm guessing uh, probably about 80, 90,000 he's going to need a week. Can, can we afford on one person 80, 90, 100,000 dollars a week to keep him afloat? I, I really don't think so. These business people has took a hit of thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And you're limiting them is basically closing them down. You might as well tell them to shut your doors down. And when they shut your doors down, they're not going to be reopening again. So when we talk about crisis, this is the crisis that we're going to face, a financial crisis with the people. Thank you, Sierra. Welcome, sir. My name is Jesse Severson. I've worked in the hospitality industry in this town for 25 plus years. You don't need an ordinance right now to uh, have not that many or our occupancy. You can throw a coin down our down there right now. Um, I had to send a text out today to. 46 employees talking about how their hours will probably go to part-time hours. Full-time employees. Not an easy text to make. Not an easy phone call or conversation to have with your employees. The last time you guys put this on us, we were shamed on social, social media by the council. Not by... It... It doesn't make sense to kick us while we're down. This industry will never, never, ever recover 100% from this, this first shutdown. The second, we, we made our decision in May. You guys made the decision in May, right? To let us handle our business the way we handle our business. Thank God I'm not an owner of the business because I wouldn't want that on my shoulders. But having those other employees, my direct employees below me, that's, can't imagine having to tell them, look, we got to shut you down. Plus you don't get, you get your unemployment, but you don't get any extras anymore because of restrictions that aren't needed because there's not that many people in there. And when we do have people in there, I got mortgage to pay. I got children to feed. I got health insurance I got to pay. When, when you got people that want to come out, let them come out. Like I said, you don't need six feet. You can go into any restaurant in town and see that it's not needed. There's not people in these seats. Don't cripple us while we're down. Allow us to make the decisions that are benefits our employees and our patrons. Allow us to run our businesses so we can continue to make sure that our, our employees feed their kids, pay their mortgage, and get their medicine, you know. So, please, think about the people that are already hurting and don't stick us while we're down. All right, thank you, sir. Anyone else here to speak on this item? Please come forward. Go ahead, ma'am. Hi, my name is Jackie Peterson Krenz, and I'm the owner of Dance Gallery across the street. I normally, in a good year, have about 500 students, and uh, since last March, we've dropped down about a third, which is 
I guess typically normal for a dance studio. Um, the the struggle I'm having is I, I can see where this is going to get worse and worse, especially with a no lingering ordinance. I am against it. Um, the other part is just facts from my studio and what I know about my business and how it works. Um, I have children there. I've got children of all ages. And the thing that we've been able to make work is we have had a, a mask mandate for our studio and it's worked very well. Um, some are in, in favor of it, some are not. And I'm and that's fine. I just tell them, you, if you want to come to the studio, you will wear a mask, and that's good. Um, the, the thing that I found really great is that I have been able to have up to about 15 plus kids in a studio about the size of this room, and we are within six feet apart, and I have had no case of spread in a dance studio with a mask on. Um, having said that, I can't speak for the time the children uh, sit side by side with no mask on eating. So that's a different story. But I'm telling you as a business owner, I'm able to care for my students and take care of our students and the families without a big spread at our studio. And I'm hoping that you guys will take the time to think about that as a business owner, I know what I'm doing. I know how to deal with my kids. I don't need you to tell me what to do in order to save my kids and keep them healthy. And I hope you take that into consideration before passing this mandate. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jackie. Anyone else here to speak on this one tonight? Come on up. Good evening. Good evening, hi, my name is Alan Gray. I'm a local business owner, The Rush. For those who are not familiar, it's a bar restaurant. Um, back open I after the tornado, this. right? What's that? Finally back open after Finally the tornado. That was one of my points. Right. Last time I went through this, <clears throat> fortunately, I had a tornado tear my business down. I didn't have to go through this. There's no tornado this time to save me, okay? I'm a small business owner. If you start putting restrictions on what already has restrictions on our business, as the man spoke earlier, you know, we're already limited on customers. You know, I can show you our business any night of the week. Um, on the weekends, we've been particularly busy. Obviously, you know, people get st stuck at home. They want to get out and they go out and do it. Um, we try to keep it as responsible as possible. But uh, try and, I know she spoke of trying to give us financial assistance. You know, Mark will tell you the same thing. There isn't enough money to support every business in this town. It's just not practical. Um, we're already being punished enough. Um, Again, my point is that if you restrict us beyond what you've already restricted us with, um, and you know, you know how fitting that we're here at 11 o'clock at night, you know, and we're the bar bar owners, you know, and you had to listen to all these people and all their expertise. That's what we do all the time, except we put up with them when they're not sober. <laughs> so at any rate, I just wanted to I just wanted to get up here and speak for the bar restaurant owners and let you know that it's not practical to have a lingering law. People aren't gonna put their mask on, go to the bathroom, come back, take their mask off, drink their drink, and not stop and talk to me, and not stop and talk to you. It's a social setting. It's not practical to have a lingering law. Um, so that's all I had to say. Thank Thanks, you. Alan. Thanks for being here. Yep. Good evening. Welcome. Council, welcome again, James Gordon. As I said, I moved here from Nashville. Let me tell you a story about that town. A city that saw $23.8 billion a year in tourism spending in a five block radius. We closed March 12th by order of the city. To this day, we're still not open. When I moved here in September, I moved here because I had finally, my stubborn you know, self finally ran out of options. I lost everything. I lost my home, I filed bankruptcy. I had to tell 1,138 employees, I'm out of money. I don't know if the other partners can keep it going, but I can't. If you continue to put restrictions on, you know, on bars and restaurants, we're back to the, the tricky and selective science. Are you gonna put those same restrictions on Walmart, on Hy-Vee, on Kohl's, on other businesses? Or does COVID only affect people in bars and restaurants? Just like when we say we're going to have, you know, you look at other cities, New York, Philadelphia, Miami, Los Angeles, San Francisco. They still haven't opened to indoor dining and their cases are still skyrocketing. 
What will happen if you shut down bars and restaurants in Sioux Falls, people will still gather. They will now gather at home. They will have house parties where they're even in a more confined space. And there is no one there, is no one there that's responsible enough to have oversight to see, are you leaving the house party too drunk? Are you over-serving yourself? We are professionals in this business and we keep people safe. We allow people to have a good time. We do it responsibly. COVID has impacted us tremendously. And I'm sure that some of you have come from the private sector. And between now and December 1st, I'd like to ask you, which one of your companies would like to step up and sponsor the thousands of employees, not just bar owners, bartenders, servers, kitchen staff, busboys, who now will have no way to pay their bills? What happens when they can no longer afford to buy food, feed their kids, pay their rent? I know 23 people who have gotten COVID, 24 if you count myself. I've donated plasma three times. Luckily, unfortunately, I don't know anyone who's passed away from COVID. But like the lady who's opened this public comment, I know six people who have killed themselves this year. Six people like me who have lost everything and said, I, I'm not strong enough to rebuild. I can't do it. How many lives are you saving and how many lives are you costing? Please think of that between now and December. Thanks, James. Hi, Stephen Siano. Yeah, I had a man here uh, speaking, has a bar. Well, such activities as you are proposing here would close down France's Tavern. We wouldn't have a country. Look at the history. We need to be able to meet, to socialize. After the first two weeks, social distancing and mask wearing because we didn't know, we're beyond that, far beyond that. There's no excuse. Uh, people cite the WHO. World Health Organization and CDC have been shown, as my understanding, to be not credible. They have their agenda. They are proposing, uh, they are proposing politics, pre masquerading as medicine. Um, all those statistics, they're not credible, or maybe a little bit are, but it certainly doesn't warrant all this fear mongering and all this shutdown, which is harmful to our society, to our country, here and elsewhere around the country and around the world. Um, the uh, local facilities, the hospital facilities, including the VA, require a mask. Looks like I might, I might have to get a medical excuse before I can even go in the uh, VA to get perhaps some mobility assistance. This is unreasonable, and I think, if anything, you should ban the requirement of a mask because it's unsubstantiated, such as the fact, as I understand it, and I think evidence supports. Um, so I and somebody else that I know are being denied um, certain care because of this. And then I heard somebody uh, make a reference to uh, what I heard on the radio, a doctor in Sanford saying that they're stretched to the limit when I heard another doctor Sanford saying that they're doing okay. Um, now you can cross-reference it, I can give it names if you like. It's Allison Suttle is the former and uh, Paul uh, Jensen, I believe, was the doctor who said we're doing all right. Um, and she says, uh, we don't think anyone wants to see us stretch to the limit. And she's talking, to, she's doing a sales pitch. And that's what, when somebody with the health department or whatever is uh, presenting the statistics, that's what they're doing. It's a sales pitch and it's all about money. Thank you. Anybody that can bring this one up, might as well go to New York. This right here is going to devastate people in the eating industry. 
every restaurant that I go to and has a six foot where one table is blocked off and the next one the person sits at. They only limit at each table up to six people. Dairy Queen, it's every other, it's every other chair. Um, Taco Bell, same thing. But you know something? This is choice. If you want to sit at home with your kids and finally be able to get to know who your kids are, have supper at home. You don't have to go out. Nobody's forcing you to go get anything to eat or go have a drink or socialize. This is sickening. People realize what happened tonight. I have people standing back here. I have people watching TV. And when I come up there and say what's going to come out of the city council, we have one person that has it written down. He's reading it off. His, he's reading it off. Then the next guy, he's already got it in his head on what he's going to say. Everybody had their mind made up before they even came into this meeting. And it's no different than this, too. It's pretty sad. You guys are going to destroy people's lives? Because why? You can't make a decision on your own? On when you want to go out to eat and when you can't? People aren't stupid. Stop playing the stupid. All right, anyone else to speak tonight? Good evening. I almost said good morning. Uh, Mike, Mike Zitzer, small business owner in Sioux Falls. Very small. But it, it's struggling here. And if we, we, we just passed the mass mandate and then we got these ordinances coming through. Uh, I think Greg touched on it a little bit, a little bit ago. Uh, and another gentleman touched on it. Uh, are we going to apply all these rules on every business as equally? And if so, w w w are, these, are these laws constitutional? I mean, if you... Here's a, a question for the city attorney, if you can touch on it. What, what about the bill of rights? In our bill of rights, all laws should be e applied equally upon all persons, businesses, corporations. If we allow Walmart a little gre leeway in the, but enforce these policies on small businesses who can't or are struggling to compete, uh, do we, with all the exemptions, do, does that make it a constitutional law or not? Just a question I had. But, uh, Try to keep on trying to do the best we can, and hopefully the, the American man us through this crisis as best we can. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Anyone else here to speak on this item tonight? Ma'am, you spoke once already on this item, I believe, didn't you? But on this one? Okay. Come on up. Kathy Sherman. I guess this one kind of scares me a little more than the mask mandate. So um, my concerns would be the same. There isn't enough money to fund what you're proposing to do for everybody that would need their, you know, income replaced. Um, and from, from what I've seen, I've been able to go out with some friends and here and there, and I, I feel very, very safe. They've done an incredible job with spacing their tables already. There's, um, you know, they keep everybody separated. And if there's too many in line, we have to wait outside, even if it's, you know, 15 degrees out, that's that's what they do. So I, I just would really encourage you to, like the gentleman just before me said, is this really, you know, constitutional and do you have the, the right to, to put these mandates on? Especially small business owners, it will definitely crush. Thanks, Kathy. Hi, this is Steve Johnson here. Um, so to limit the number of people going to these places doesn't affect me much. I don't go to bars, avoid restaurants whenever possible. I'd rather have a piece of peanut butter toast. But when you, when you limit their ability to do their business, why is that? To slow the spread of COVID? So what you're saying is these guys are at the root of COVID spread and that they have to take care of it. And so without going through any due process, you're shutting them down or limiting them, which eventually does shut them down. And these guys are not the spreaders of COVID. The small people? I'm thinking it's the bigger outfits. Yeah, it happens everywhere. But why take it out on these guys? Why take it out on the small guy? It's going to be applicable 
to one. It should be applicable to all. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Good evening, sir. Come on up. My name is Mitch Rungi, local business owner. Um, much the same as what everybody else said. Um, in the restaurant and bar industry, we feel like watching what happened over the first time with Walmarts and Home Depots and people getting stimulus money and we were made out to be the bad guys. Everybody else got a pocket full of money to go get stuff to go remodel their houses and go do this and that and the other. And uh, it's, it's just not, it's not a fair playing field, you know, watching, watching Walmart be packed full of people, thousand cars in their parking lots, you know, and us be held to a 10 person. It's, it's, it's absolutely asinine. Um, I've been here for about four hours. Um, I see a lot of what I would say spineless sitting around, not paying attention. We sat here and, and, uh, and talked to you guys, and you had a prepared speech. He ain't been paying attention to anybody all night. There's one guy that has a, a backbone sitting up here, and it's this gentleman here. So that's all I got to say. All right, anyone else to speak tonight? Good evening. Mark Fonder, business owner. Um, yeah, basically, I think the citizens are proven what you guys want to do already. Our numbers have dropped big time. They're choosing, you know, to stay home, be safe and that. Uh, I have 165 employees, I guess. That's my biggest fear is trying to tell them right before the holidays, you know, you're fired, laid off. Um, I just, you know, I think if you leave it in the citizens' hands, they're gonna prove it. It's already, we went and ate at Mamalada's. If you've been there, there's six, eight tables in there anyway. The, I mean, these places will never rebound. So I just, I feel like you just leave it up to citizens and the, it'll work its way out. Thanks, Mark. All right, anyone else here to speak on this one? All right, let's get a motion on the floor and then we can move to the discussion on it. Move to approve, Brecky. Second, star. All right, that's a motion to set a data set for Tuesday, December 1 by uh, Brecky, seconded by star. Councillor Erickson, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, sorry with my delay. I don't know if I'm ever interrupting or not, so I apologize for that. Um, I do have some questions in regards to this ordinance. I understand something like this was passed early on uh, when the virus first hit the United States before we had a lot of information. Um, but I do have, um, like I said, some questions for the sponsors, um, Brecky and Starr, whomever would like to answer this. Um, within the ordinance, um, many of the targets are small businesses, particularly our restaurants, coffee shops, bars, and fitness centers. Your ordinance really omits other venues such as shops, boutiques, retail establishments. What science and what data have you used that suggests one of these businesses is more likely to spread the virus compared to others that you've exempted? My, my reasoning is this, is, is there COVID outbreak in any of these businesses that you're targeting? Well, I'm going to ask the Director of Health to come up at this time. I guess while she's coming up, my follow-up would be, Counselor, was this drafted in, in coordinates with the Department of Health? This was the one that was used by the Department of Health that went through the Board of Health. It's the same ordinance that we passed in May of this year. I understand that, but you chose to bring this forward, so I'm asking why this was brought forward and just targeting these venues. Oh, no. Well, I said it in my, my presentation. I'm, I'm really just piggybacking on what the CDC has said, that these, the, those three industries, you know, are the biggest spreaders of the virus. And so I thought, well, we already had did something that worked previously for us in flattening the curve in May. And we only had to do it for a month, as I could, best I can tell by going back and looking at the, the history of it, the date that, that we passed it and then the date that we repealed it. But we did say at that time that, you know, we would revisit it if our numbers started to spike. And so I'm just bringing back that same ordinance. And that, as I recall, that came back, that came to us after having some meetings with the Board of Health, and they recommended it. Do you have yeah, and I don't think this time it did come from the Board of Health. 
So the other question that I would pose is, is that I'm, I'm truly hearing from a lot of small businesses, such as tonight. We heard from business after business after business um, that this really unfairly targets them. And if approved, it would really be the final straw that forces them to permanently close and lay off many of their employees. What safeguards are in place to prevent those ramifications from this ordinance? I just don't see it. Other than a, a potential resolution that really doesn't have the money. I don't know where anyone's going to find millions and millions and millions of dollars if that's been well thought out or not. And I'm certainly not going to say to the administration, hey, go find the money because we're going to bail everybody out. It's just not feasible. We as a city do not have the financial means to rescue all of these businesses. It's just not there. Um, this, this week I took some opportunities to reach out to um, someone I served in the legislature which, with and who is the commissioner of GOED and asked, how would this impact you in your role in your job recruiting businesses to South Dakota and, and really just at when the time comes, what, what will this do? And this is really economic suicide. We've got to be careful. We can't waive property taxes. We can't cut public safety. We can't cut all of these other things just to hand out checks to people. People are going to vote, essentially, their comfort level with their feet. If I'm not comfortable going into a bar or restaurant, I stay home. If I walk into one that maybe feels too big, I, I did go to a birthday party and I walked in and went, ooh, this is not comfortable, and I left. I sent a message and said, hey, happy birthday. I'm sorry I can't be there. It just was uncomfortable for me. People are going to do that. If you're not comfortable, don't go. This is economic suicide for all of these small businesses, and we've got to be able to make sure that, one, we're not having additional issues as we move through this. And, and like I said, reaching out to some of these business owners even Friday night, they're down 40% from their business. Naturally, this is already happening and we don't need this ordinance. I hope that we can just um, kill this on the first reading and continue to just go ahead with the mass mandate that was voted on earlier to see if that does make a difference to those that believe in that. Thank you. Other, other discussion, Council, Council Kiley, go ahead. Thank you. Um, earlier this evening and last week, I discussed about, uh, discussed least restrictive measures and I'm committed to that. Uh, and I felt that the mask mandate was the least restrictive measure. Um, this, however, impacts the businesses that are hardest hit. And, and I do have a concern with that. Um, it is basically, in this case, it's a choice that people are willingly making to go to restaurants and bars and to the other establishments, the clubs, cafes, and other sim uh, similar places. Uh, it is a choice. It's not like having to go out for the necessities, like getting your, your groceries or picking up hardware so you can re repair your broken kitchen sink or replacing the refrigerator, if you can get one, uh, when that goes down. Um, so I do have reservations but I will forward this to a second reading, but just so the sponsors know that I do have uh, some pretty severe reservations regarding this. Any other discussion amongst council on this, Councilor Starr? Yes, if I could, Mr. Mayor, I have a couple of questions for the health director, because I kind of want to approach this from a different direction. Thank you, Director. I, I appreciate you being here tonight. One of the, the questions that I have, I was uh, surprised by the revelation from today's news conference with Dr. Basil, I believe, stating the number of ICU beds that are available. He used a number that they had 11 available beds in their 37 uh, uh, hospital units uh, across their system and normally that they like to see at least one bed per, per facility so that if somebody crashes, I believe his words, so that they would have some place to, to at least help the person. Tell me, I, I look at the dashboard that we see on our uh, city website. 
I don't see those kind of numbers. So where am I missing the, the disconnect between what our healthcare workers are telling us of being overrun and our dashboard that says things are consistent and there really isn't any increases. So I'm missing something somewhere between the, the two sets of numbers. Well, uh, so Jill Franken, public health director, and um, there's a lot of different factors that we take into account when we're um, working with our unified command and our healthcare partners to understand um, where the demand versus capacity is in, in this particular community. And um, what we know, um, while we may be seeing a fairly consistent hospital census or what we're saying for a number of patients with COVID that are in the hospital right now, that, that may look somewhat steady. Um, it's a really significant number and that they are um, taxed uh, right now and that they are having to really um, implement their surge plans. Um, and those surge plans are requiring everyone in the hospital to it's kind of an all hands on deck right now and everybody, you know, responding in ways that are very different than they, for example, nurses doing things that they haven't had to do before. Teams of nurses having a lead team member who is expert in ICU care, overseeing several other staff, for example, that maybe don't work in ICU. Um, you know, there's just a multitude of ways that we're understanding the circumstances that are occurring right now um, and so just to look at that, da that one of the quartile of the dashboard um, is just one factor to help educate the community um, on where the trends are going with our hospital, um, you know, number of patients in the hospital with COVID. Um, but certainly there's many other variables and factors that we're discussing with them on a twice weekly basis. One of the things, would, would you call it yet that we're having to ration care? I mean, we're, if we're not, we're very close to that. That's what my emails are telling me from healthcare workers, the people that are working on the floor, the people that are doing it day to day. They're having to make choices about who gets the quality care. I think for me to answer that question would be um, not a, a responsible thing to do. I think it would be better to have the health systems be able to respond to that information, you know, to that question. Um, but I think that's something that's really quite moment by moment. It's not, um, it's not something that just occurs and then all of a sudden you're, you know, in a position where you're really trying to make sure you have the beds available for ICU patients versus your ED having availability for your traumas that are coming in, um, et cetera. And we're talking about systems um, across, um, you know, hospital systems that serve multiple communities and trying to balance the needs of those communities and where those patients need to be in Sioux Falls versus in their small communities. It's, it's, it's an extremely complex um, uh, structure right now that they're trying to uh, navigate. One of the things that, that we talked earlier about, it's, it, it is amazing that we're hearing two different things, maybe from the leadership of the hospitals versus what we're hearing from the people who are working in the trenches of how severe the problem is. And I get that we don't want to panic people, but I sure feel like we're really close to that. The, the, what we don't want to get to is where there aren't beds available and that we have to ration care. And... We're starting to see, well, let me, let me do it this way. We're starting to see the problems then in the schools as well. And you get a chance to visit with them at least uh, from the private schools and the public schools. We're seeing Rapid City has gone to a at-home uh, process because their staff, it's not the students that are sick as much as the, the, what we're at least seeing in the media is that the students are there. We're seeing one uh, school district already in Sioux Falls starting to talk about that and the number of things. Are we at that point where, where schools need to start uh, looking at staying at home because of the number of cases that we're gonna have to go back to uh, um, sending the students home at some point because the numbers are approaching that? Well, that too is not my decision to make. Uh, it, that would be for the superintendents of schools and the school boards to be you know, discussing those and making those recommendations. You can go on our website SiouxFalls.org forward slash COVID-19 and you can see the status of the schools in our area and where they're at with their 
green versus yellow versus orange status and, and what they're doing at the particular schools. And so, um, you know, I would just say you passed a really important um, set of ordinance tonight that is going to, I believe, uh, make a difference. And I think that we as a community can see where we land with increased usage of masks in our community and where that will gain us um, some additional curbing of the uh, increase in, in transmission in our community. Um, one more, if I could. One of the things, I guess, that I'm interested in and that I think we all would be, talk a little bit about the forecasting that we're doing. Tell me about where we're looking in the next two weeks, the next month for hospitalizations. What kind of numbers, where are we going to be? There's got to be, we, we did a lot of forecasting in the spring. Some of it was true. Some of it was because we took mitigation uh, efforts that they, the forecasting didn't come true. And, I, and I'm asking you to predict the future a little bit, and I know that's a very difficult thing to do. But what are the hospital systems saying? Where are they? Because I see the numbers going straight up. There's a percentage of those folks that are going to need a hospital bed. And if we're already pushing capacity, we're not seeing a decrease in the forecast over the next couple of weeks or the next month through the winter, are we? Uh, which forecasting are you specifically well, let's, wanting let's to Let's just do hospital beds and hospital admissions. You know, the number of cases, I'm sure the, the, the forecast would be similar. I mean, it's a, a percentage of that. Well, you know, what they're doing is really trying to look at a number of variables. One of the things that's going to make a difference in the forecasting, quite frankly, is what happened tonight and what will hopefully happen with a resolution that's upcoming on the agenda. You know, those types of mitigation efforts are going to make a difference in how they're forecasting where we're going to be at. And that's going to be based on if we can see a curbing of cases that are occurring, um, positivity you know, rates may be coming down where we see better testing and better percentage of testing being done. All those factors you know, can hopefully see then over that next two to three weeks then decreasing hospitalizations if we can curb the transmission of the virus. And so um, you know, we have the holidays coming and so you know, there's a couple of different scenarios that the health systems are looking at if we have increasing transmission over the holidays, you know, that could relay, you know, perhaps some increasing cases in the hospitals. But if we can do a good job and do the kind of mitigation efforts that we've been talking about, and if we can decide as a community that we are going to take this action to curb the spread along with physically distancing, making sure, you notice I haven't touched this <laughs> lectern here because I, just don't feel comfortable doing so, and I'll probably clean it when I'm done up here. Just, Please, it yeah. had to have been driving you nuts and, all night um, watching it. Yeah, and so those are the things we have to do right now, and I, and I trust our community that we can make it an improvement on our rates if we can take those actions. All right, so I have to push just a little bit. What are we looking at in the next two weeks? Are we to the point where we're going to have it, be having to ration care in the next month? I mean, I know there's a lot of variables. You've seen the graphs, you've seen the forecasts. Where are we going to be? I have not been informed by either of the health systems, nor am I aware that Mayor Paul has that um, they're feeling like we're in a position where care will be rationed. Will we be pushing the limits of our health systems and the staff feel really, you know, like they're working harder than they've ever worked? Absolutely. You know, I was a staff nurse for nine years. And I know the realities of when you can feel uh, increased and overwhelmed census in the hospital. So I understand that. Um, and so I really empathize with, with our frontline workers because they've been doing a lot of work for many, many weeks now. Um, but I have not been hearing from the health systems that they feel like we're, they're going to be, um, as you put it, um, rationing care. Well, I think I, I hadn't heard that either until I heard Dr. Basil's story today. And, and that's where my concern's coming from, is that now all of a sudden we're hearing a totally different story today than what we've heard up to this point. We've heard a lot tonight about uh, where we're at and what'll work and what won't work, and I know that that's part of the, the, the forecasting through this. I, I, I just, I'm bewildered that we're at this point and we're gonna continue to see that. And we're gonna unfortunately see our schools, you know, We'll see what works. 
and, and depending on whose side of the, the issue it is, whether this mask mandate will make a difference and if it is enough. And that's why I, I feel strongly that this has got to at least hang out there, that we have this ability by having a vehicle to take the immediate actions we're going to need to take if we do get to that point where the, the system is overrun or they are to the point where they're having to make decisions over who gets care and who doesn't and who gets quality care. It's one of the things I remember talking with Dr. Wildey about. We had the, the physical space. Are we gonna have the human capital available to do the care that's going to be needed? We know we have the infrastructure to take care of the numbers. I'm not sure, and I don't think he did at that time, and I, I would be interested in hearing his latest update of where we're at, whether we're gonna have the people to actually do that. So, Councilor thank you. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, thank you, Director. It it's getting getting late. So, I I, I anyway. I was going to say I'm going to try to keep it short. But when has anybody kept it short when they said that? So it, it it was said multiple times tonight by previous speakers that it won't stop at a mass mandate and it's a slippery slope. Little did we know it would only take 30 minutes to get to the next step. So um, we're we're already here. Um, I feel for the fact that hospitals locally, that they're stressed out. I mean, I, I have a neighbor who, who is a nurse, and she's very angry with me right now, I assure you, very angry with me. And I consider her a close friend, and I'm, I'm very sad about that, that I don't have a different position on this. But around the world, we're seeing all of these stories about hospitals overrun, and these places have mass mandates and lockdowns for months. I, I, I don't grasp why we think things are going to be different here. I, so I, I, I don't get that. The, the other thing is when we look at this, the first time around, I guess we maybe had a bogey. I, I, I feel like I made a, a, a big mistake on, on that one the first time around. But at the time, we were just going through it and we had the projections of huge, huge numbers of 5% were going to die and we were going to have thousands and thousands in the hospital. And it turns out that the experts were not just wrong, they were way wrong. It wasn't even close. Now, maybe that was good faith there or whatever. I, that, that's fine. But I, I find it interesting that we're now taking credit as government that we didn't surge and we, and we didn't spike because of the no linger that we put in. There's no proof whatsoever that that did anything. It's probably more likely that the numbers were just wrong. And so we're, we're taking credit for that. The, I, I think we should have learned from other places and from our own experience that lockdowns do far more damage than they solve. We create so many other effects and we don't count the costs. We, we learn that and that this is a start of a lockdown. There's not enough money in the entire city budget to make whole every business that is going to be harmed by this and everybody that loses their job and everybody and all of the, the, the suicides. We don't have enough money. There, I mean, it would take tens of millions of dollars. There's no, there's no possible way. Businesses are already doing the right things. There, there's no reason to, to punish them. This isn't the, the right approach and I've had a lot of businesses that are really, really scared right now and I would urge you to kill this on the first reading because I don't think it should be even hanging out there that there's even an option that we would do this. Thank you. Thank you. Other discussion? Council, Councilor Selberg, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I will be short. Uh, I can appreciate the sentiment behind this and I appreciate the conversation, but it's my belief that um, this would stifle small businesses that are already struggling at this time. So I, I just, I, I can't support it at this time. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Any other discussion, Council, on this? Councillor Brecky. I would just say one final thing. I, you know, I, I am reluctant to pass it myself, but you know, if the numbers are at a place where we're into rationing care, or as Council members, you know, uh, Star just talked about, it, if we are, our systems are completely overwhelmed. You know, this was a tool that we did use before. And so my thought was to just, you know, have it staged up just in case we have to, you know, dramatic times call for dramatic efforts. And if it's something that we had to at least talk about, 
um, we would be able to do that. So I hope you'll just bring it on for a second reading. Um, I'm hoping that we won't have to take that step. Thank you, Councillor. All right, let's call for a vote on this time. Council members Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? No. Selberg? No. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? No. Jensen? No. All right, that's a 4 4 tie. Uh, just my vote. I'll just say ditto to Selberg, uh, Councillor Neitzert, and the others. I don't want this hanging over the business community right now. They don't need this. Um, and I don't believe it's so much. Mine's a no. So that fails five to four. Uh, next item, please. Next item, item 35, first reading, an emergency ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, to require face covering in an indoor public place where six foot social distancing cannot be achieved. Recommendation set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. Sponsors, council members Brecky and Starr, and I forgot to read, Mayor, um, a note on there. This item may be withdrawn pending the disposition of item 38. All right, Councillor Brecky or Starr? Which one was this one? Oh, um, at this time, wait a minute. I'm sorry, which one are we on? We're on, okay, this is. Item, th <laughs> item 35, it's a potential motion to withdraw, I think, based on the outcome. Right. Yes, okay, based on the outcome of the reconsideration motion, I would move to withdraw item, item 38. Second, star. Motion to withdraw item 35 by Councilor Brecky, seconded by Starr. Uh, any discussion on that, Council? My, my only question, Mr. Star, Mayor, is do we take public input if we're on a motion to withdraw, being it's already on the agenda? I don't, I don't believe so. Right. I mean, it's being withdrawn. It's not up for final consideration. Right. So, no. That's fine. So, um, we'll take a vote on that motion to withdraw. Council members Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. Next item, please. Item 36, a resolution of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, outlining the expectations for the people of Sioux Falls to take action to slow the spread of the virus that causes COVID-19. One Sioux Falls COVID-19 action plan sponsors the mayor. All right, this is our last uh, uh, COVID initiative tonight. I'm actually passing the gavel to Councillor Selberg because Councillor Neitzert would chair it. Uh, he's got an amendment he wants to make. Councillor Sales on the phone, so former Chair Selberg is going to chair this item. Uh, essentially, what you have in front of you uh, is a resolution. And uh, I think based on everything we've heard over the last five hours, our community and our city state in some ways is really anxious for some uni unity, right? What are some things we can agree on as a city and as a community uh, as to actions that we need to take as a whole? And I'm trying to shift the dialogue away from just masks or no masks. I'm, I'm fried on that conversation. What I want to talk about is the totality of the behavior that we really need to see in our community, which include masks. And so what you have is a resolution that basically uh, shows the city's support and hopefully this council's support on the items listed here. Section one being masks worn in the settings that we just approved in the ordinance tonight. So doubling down on that. That was in there because we may or may not have passed tonight. Um, it says masks shall be worn, which is consistent with the ordinance we just passed. Section two we got to continue to talk about the stuff that we, we, we aren't putting a lot of attention on in terms of the hand hygiene and the staying at home and the obtaining proper medical care and all those other pieces that aren't getting nearly as much conversation as they quite honestly need to right now. Section three of this resolution is really one of the biggest challenges I'm seeing right now is that we need to talk more about people, the emotional and mental fragility, as I call it, that I'm seeing in our community. And it's very real. You saw it tonight. Uh, I'm seeing it every day in my office. And so how are we uh, encouraging people to take uh, emotional, mental, and physical health? Uh, one lady talked about it tonight. What are we doing to encourage people's physical health right now? To get out from behind their computer and from Facebook and actually get some vitamin D and fresh air, which is good for the mental psyche in this. Section four. 
you know, the city of Sioux Falls as an employer, we've recently done this, but I would really like to encourage businesses through this resolution to move their employees to remote work environments for now if they can. And that's a very easy thing to do. A lot of businesses had to do that early on. We as a city figured out how to do that. We have some people in, uh, I'll call them white collar roles, engineers or, or parks planners that can do their job anywhere. And so putting them back in remote environments is just a smart move right now because while the mandate that we passed on masks talks a lot about businesses, I'll tell you where you're seeing spread is in break rooms, is in conference rooms, is in house parties, sleepovers. Those are, those are problem areas as well, and we didn't even touch those tonight. And so we need to continue to talk about that behavior, including the spread at work. And then section five, important to, I think we need to really support those businesses that are doing the right things right now in all this. And one of those is taking this Safer Sioux Falls pledge that the chamber is leading and we need to get behind. And that pledge basically reinforces what are the proper actions that a business can take right now to ensure the safety of their patrons. Everything from encouraging our staff to get flu shots, to the mask wearing with employees and staff, to multiple hand sanity stations, to checking temps of employees when they come to work, all those things. So this is hopefully nothing controversial in here. It's just a statement, ideally, of unity from our body to the public that says, hey, this council gets that these things are important. Um, we're trying to put controversial items aside and say, hey, how can we band together during this time and reinforce and double down on some of these key messaging points outside of just masking that we know the community needs to see. So I'll shut up there, uh, and I would um, turn it over to the chair. All right, I think at this time we would ask if anybody has any public input on the item. Now is your time. This is another one that isn't needed because I think a lot of your, a lot of your uh, businesses are doing this already. You guys have this, you guys have this city so divided it isn't even funny. You got your scare tactic out there, and it is from several city council members, and it is pathetic. I just don't understand. You guys, you're never going to get unity from the public that you, you guys lost that a long time ago, way back in July. I told you people that the numbers were going to be twice as high. Did you listen? Hell no. You guys don't care because you knew it was coming into flu season. Now you're gonna to try to put a little mandate here, a little band-aid there, and, and try to get people, you know, I tried to tell you, maybe what we should do is try to get people to get healthy. If you're overweight, walk around the block a few times. Get some exercise. But this is pathetic. Steven Ziano. I'll try not to touch this. I might be infectious. Um, I heard uh, people taking, like, uh, Councillor Brecky took credit for uh, actions done in May, that there's no control group to, uh, uh, to compare to, and that's been a problem throughout this uh, escapade, this fear-mongering, uh, with every aspect of it that I see, there's no control group. It's not scientific. It's just fear-mongering is what I see. And uh, also about sick people uh, don't need hospital beds, uh, Councillor Starr. Um, we, when we get sick, can take care of ourselves at home generally if we know how to do it. And that turns to the health department's responsibility uh, as was mentioned also, uh, to educate us, to uh, supplement properly uh, vitamin D, zinc, uh, C, uh, for instance. And I've heard uh, medical professionals on both sides of the issue. Um, anyone can be ignorant of any situation, any of us, only means we don't understand, we don't know. Um, and as for any viruses out there, hey, like I said, the genie's out. 
Uh, there's nothing you can do to contain it. So get over it. You know, give it to a higher power. So uh, I also heard dramatic times require uh, or necessitate dramatic effort. Well, once again, get over it, do the right thing, and look into the history, what's been going on with various medical procedures. I've been subjected to uh, unnecessary medical procedures, starting with perhaps um, a tonsillectomy, which was later, well, I could go back even further, a circumcision. That was shown not to be efficacious, um, but it was routine. Why? Look at the history. Why was it promoted by doctors? Uh, so various things. Cancer, a slow-growing cancer, can stay for decades without causing harm. Thank you. Anybody else? Come on up. Mike Zinner, Sioux Falls. I like to say this is a, this is a good resolution by the mayor. I think this is actually what I think he's got it right. He hit it right here. I don't think the mask mandate was what we needed. The, all those other ordinances we could do away with, but what the, the mayor is proposing here is perfect. It lets the businesses do what they need to do, and we can if we have any we want any guidance, we we just pay talk to the mayor. The only the only question I got for the mayor is section five. Uh, Section five. I mean, my my only concern with that one. Is what what would you what would you recommend to pe people who patronize those certain businesses, while at the same time they go on social media, and just because they might not like my policy or some other business policy, what what would you recommend to those people from not public shaming businesses just because they don't have they don't, either they don't like their policy or or they're not doing exactly what they what they wish they would be doing. That's my only concern with that. But. Great job, and that's perfect. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I, I was telling these doctors uh, in Sanford um, last week because they were like so specific. Well, how can you say this? We need a mask. When you go to the doctor to get a vasectomy, you can go have that done. You can go have an abortion done. It's your right, it's your body. So having a mask and telling governments to tell people that you have to wear a mask on your body, are you serious? So that ordinance that was in place should have been a resolution. We don't live in North Korea. I think we're stepping over boundaries here with, uh, with people's rights. People has a right to choose of what they want to do with their body. Go to the doctor, have procedures done, it's their right. So having this mask and, and, and pushing this mask and pushing people to isolation is going to, and I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to speak on the police again. Our domestics is up because of isolation. So do we want people to work from home? No, because the domestics are up. Just because we have your, we have your rich people with domestics too. And I'm not even going to begin to tell you on the rich side of towns with domestics, verbal, uh, verbal uh, abuse that the police are getting called to. So we have it in all parts of the city on verbal, mostly because of alcohol. So do, do we isolate them and tell them to stay home and uh, work from home so we can build up that tension more because they're working from home, they're with their families at home more and more and more? No, absolutely not. We have to lower, and I'm going to keep saying this, lower the police calls, lower the stress and the crisis that the police is happening on. Domestic calls is on the rise. We're not going to have a, de uh, in uh, a decrease on domestics if we encourage people to stay home and work from home and not get out of their home to go to work from to go to work out of the outside of their homes. So again, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to say it on the behalf of the police. The police is stressed with domestics. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Can we get a motion? Move to approve. Second, Jensen. 
Move to approve by Kylie, seconded Jensen. And discussion, councilors? Or Councilor Neitzert? Yes, Councilor Selberg. I'd like to make a motion to amend the first sentence of section one and two by replacing the word shall with should. Second, Erickson. Okay. Who's the second? Take a vote on the amendment, or go ahead. It, it, it just very simply, it just comes down to the, the good faith uh, position of whether it should be a mandate versus a recommendation. Okay, thank Simple you. as that. Any discussion on that? Councillor Selver? Yes, Councillor Kiley. Um, I will not be voting for this amendment. I mean, we just, we just passed a, a mask mandate uh, oh, an hour or whatever, two ago. Uh, this is absolutely counter to that. I do not support this. Okay. Anybody? Any other feedback? Okay. Do we take a vote on the amendment then right away? Council members Kylie? No. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? No. Sale? No. Starr? No. Brecky? No. Erickson? Yes. Jensen, no. And me being over here off sleeping, I did not count that well. That was six to two. Six to two, <laughs> one defeated. Thank you. Forgot what I was doing and being in charge here. Do we take a motion then on the main? On the main motion. All right, yes. let's take a vote. Council members Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? No. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? No. Jensen? Yes. That passes six to two. All right, we'll move on to our next item, 37. Thanks, Marshall. Item 37, a resolution amending the 2020-24 capital program to add a storage freezer in 2020 for the health department. Sponsors the mayor. I see I have 14 seconds, so I'm gonna be really fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, this actually is a expenditure. Um, this will allow us to purchase a, a freezer, one of the sub-zero freezers that will be needed. It's a very small one, um, but it does uh, require us to amend our capital uh, plan for the health department. Uh, this will allow us to then be eligible to receive vaccine uh, when it becomes available. Um, Pfizer vaccine um, it has a requirement uh, for this type of refrigeration, so uh, that's what it'll be used for. And once we're done with it for the Pfizer vaccine, we can use it for other vaccine storage, and we do have a freezer coming due for replacement in the near future, so it serves a good purpose that way too. So that's it. Thanks, Jill. Anyone from the public here to speak on that one? Councilors, you got any questions for Jill on that item? Move to approve. Second. All right, motion by Kylie, seconded by Selberg to approve. Is there any discussion there? Councillor Neitzer? I just want to say this is something t very tangible that we can do, and so I'm excited for it. <laughs> All right, let's take a vote on that, please. Council members Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. Council, any new business tonight? Move to adjourn, Star. Second, Brecky. All right, motion by Star, seconded by Brecky to adjourn. Uh, all those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed? Yes. All right, we are adjourned. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.